William J. for the state. James Owens on behalf of Sarah Boone. Tony Henderson, Sarah Boone. Kevin Beck, Sarah Boone. Ma'am, good morning. Can you please state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. All right. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a black suit and a pink blouse. She is in custody in this matter. However, there are no restraints that are affixed to her person. So we will be standing when our jury enters and exits. Before we bring in our jury this morning, yesterday the court had reserved on a Richardson hearing regarding Exhibit 2 is identified in the defendant's fifth amended reciprocal discovery exhibit list, specifically 119 pages of records from Advent Health Winter Park that were provided to the state yesterday morning by way of USB drive. Yesterday, the court had ordered that the defense was to provide an edited version of only the records pertaining to anxiety and the lack thereof or anything pertaining to those matters but before 9 a.m. this morning. Was that done, Mr. Owens? Okay. Mr. Jay, have you had the opportunity to review the culled down list of 119 documents? Yes, sir. Okay. What is remaining of those 119 specific JPEG images and what do they pertain to? Respect. You know, most of them deal with just billings, uh, observations by the medical personnel, so it don't necessarily apply to the issue of anxiety, as the court indicated. I did include uh, certain pages that discuss depression issues as I believe that they were related to anxiety uh, and then I've identified four or five other pages that are not anxiety related but may be the case. Of those 119 images, how many are being sought? 15? Okay, thank you. State response. Apparently, these are all just related to a January 23rd, 2018 admission at Advent Health Winter Park. So it appears they're not seeking to introduce uh, any records from other instances that were contained in the records that were first disclosed to the state on September 27th. You speak of the 81 pages? Yes, sir. Thank you. Nor the new 119 pictures um, that still not in a PDF form. Um, so. Of the 15 pages, the first two that they list are pages 9 and 10 out of 111, and I believe I've identified them as best I can. However, the bait stamp from the hospital is over other text, and there is no other bait stamp. So I had to, I'm guessing that it's pages 9 and 10 out of 111. Um, it appears to just be a health information sharing sheet, like a contract. I don't understand the relevance of those two pages. Pages 21. And then they skip 22, 23, 24, and 25 are all part of her initial assessment on 123.18. We don't uh, object to those pages, but for, and I apologize that there is a but for, um, the fact that at the bottom of page 25 begins her toxicology screening, and that does go into page 26, and they did not indicate that they want to use page 26. However, without page 26, uh, we are going to experience relevancy issues and uh, a 403 objection from the state. And that is because in her toxicology screen, for which she is coming to the treatment to seek treatment for depression, depression symptoms, she is at 165 uh, for ethanol, meaning when converted, it's 0.165 grams per deciliter, over twice the legal limit. Um, it's a central nervous system depressant. Um, we are going to have at least one medical doctor, well, two. The forensic pathologist will testify for the state, and then um, our expert on battered spouse syndrome, if we get to that point, is also a medical doctor. She's a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. Um, will tell us that ethanol is a central nervous system depressant. I believe even the psychologist will, will be able to get that information in. So we are objecting to pages 21 through 25 coming in without page 26. If I understand your argument, is it a rule of completeness issue? 
Yeah, I mean, in, in the sense that it applies to documents as opposed to statements. I mean, it is an out-of-court statement, so it is a rule of a completeness issue, particularly when the symptoms and the complaints of the patient on that particular day were crying and being depressed and showing signs of using a central nervous system depressant. Um, the rest of the talk screen, pages 27 and 28, um, they did not list. We are not uh, complaining uh, that they are not including that. Uh, page 29 is another page they listed that's more of a narrative about her visit at uh, January 23rd, 2018. We do not object. Page 43 uh, is just her vital signs. We don't object. Page 44 is more of the initial assessment on this January 23rd, 2018 visit. We do not object, nor do we object to pages 45, 46, or 47. What are pages 45, 46, and 47, just for my own? More of this initial assessment uh, of January 23rd, 2018 was my understanding. Okay. Page 48, um, we are asking again that this be included. Um, again, uh, I don't believe it's super mysterious why we are going from pages 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, and then skipping page 48, and then going to 49, but we do want page 48 included. Uh, on that page includes her height and weight at the time. Um, page 63. What's 49? So seemingly that's included. 49 uh, is just some results. Again, it's misleading and doesn't provide full context without what I've described as page 26, because part of the results on page 49 show that she was Bless tested, you. shows that she was tested for the presence of ethyl alcohol or ethanol. Um, but it doesn't give the results. Are the results contained in another page? Just on page 26, the one I previously described as wanting included. So not following 49 to 50 or 51 sequentially? No, because the, the pages they want from the 40s are 43 through 47, skipping 48, and we're asking for 48 to be included between 47 and 49 to make sure it's relevant and complete. And but they are also seeking 49, correct? Yes. Thank you. Just, they, they just skipped 48, just like they skipped 26. Okay. Um, <clears throat> page 63, uh, it appears to be repetitive, but we don't have any particular uh, objection to page 63 of the 111. Page 108 seems to be another part of the initial assessment from January 23rd, 2018, so we don't object to that. So I basically we're asking for pages 26 and 48 to be included. Okay, thank you. Um, the defense did, or I'm sorry, the state did seek a Richardson uh, hearing yesterday in this matter, and based on binding precedent by the Sixth District Court of Appeal, Young v. State, 369 Southern 3rd, 1243, regardless of the culling down of the records, the court still is required to conduct a Richardson hearing. As to the issue of whether the defendant's violation was inadvertent or willful, Mr. Owens had advised that these documents were um, obtained sometime last week. He was unable to provide any specificity. He's going to confer with his office. Um, Mr. Owens or Mr. Beck, are you in a position to advise when these documents were first requested, when they were received, and when they were sent to the state? Specifically, any documents pertaining to uh, Exhibit 2, the Advent Health Winter Park records. Judge, I, I, I did check with my secretary, Margaret, and my understanding is I, I, I didn't know that was going to be a question about when we actually sent it out. I know it was um, one of my trips down here. I got Sarah Boone to sign a medical release. We sent it to the hospital. It took a couple of weeks, I want to say. We got it last week. Uh, we don't know exactly when. We, we don't time stamp at our office when something is mailed in, and it was mailed in from the hospital to my office. Um, for whatever reason, uh, the records did not get to Shelby, who was handling that issue, until late. And I think it was yesterday or the day before that she was aware that they had not been disclosed. We provided uh, the copy to the state at that time. So did these records come in batches? Because my understanding, based on the state's representation and their objections, was that the first 81 pages came on September 27th. Those were provided. Yeah, those were separate. Those were records that some of the other lawyers, one of the other lawyers had received. 
and we sent them on, but the problem was they had notes on them. So we sent that 81, but it wasn't directly from the hospital. So we were trying to get a more complete, unedited uh, copy of the records. That's why we made our request. Okay, and when was the um, error identified in time as to when these items were not sent, such that they were provided via USB yesterday? Whatever date we gave them is when we realized there was an error, that same day. Okay, my understanding that would have been yesterday morning? Yes. Okay. Anything else, sir? If I may, real quickly, uh, based on the invoice that was sent from uh, the Report Advance Billing Department, uh, this is separate from the subcontractor, the request was made on the 27th of September. I suspect they waited until they received confirmation of payment. $135 for receipt of that, so we received those. So it's all been within a couple of weeks, plus we had the hurricane issue last week, and so I think there were issues as to the matter of being provided for. I did speak to my witness yesterday afternoon after I had a chance to look the record and five to sessions of these matters or relationship to, and was told that they already had those records and familiar with them. So I don't think there's any prejudice to the state. Any further argument or positions with regard to the Richardson analysis, Mr. J? Yes, for the purpose of this hearing, I'd like to get back the documents. Is that the 119 pages, sir? No, sir. It's the 81 pages that we got on September 27, 2024. Any objection? All right, what was pre-marked A for the purposes of the Richardson hearing will be received without objection as <laughs> states one. Just a reference that one pages were all marked up um, by the defense. There's no, there's no markings. Um, the issue and the confusion that the state attorney's office still has, though, is page 68 of 81 of these original 81 documents. If you have a cell phone on, they need to be silenced and turned off, please. If you cannot follow the court's instructions. Due to the publicity in this case, I will ask for you to be removed. Does everyone understand? Thank you. You may proceed. And I, I realize that I've only had a limited amount of time uh, to review the 119 pages that came in yesterday. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's more difficult to review those because it's just it's not in a PDF where I can word search it and, and do any of the things that are afforded to us with modern technology. It came in as 119 separate JPEGs. They're not in order. So for instance, when I, I'm trying to look for page 43 of those 111 records out of the 119 pages, it's not in order. Um, and I've done my absolute best to try and see if this page, which is 68. Uh, yes. And referring to 68 of the 81 that was yes, entered as one, correct? Yes, sir. Thank it you. is sub-labeled within these records as page two of 14, and it appears to be a part of her visit on January 23rd, 2018. And in the social history provided, um, it says alcohol use denies, tobacco use denies, um, and the other part isn't relevant. And I just haven't been able to find that. And so I'm asking for the leeway um, to continue to try and search for that particular page out of the 119 so that I may ask that out of the doctrine of completeness and fairness uh, that it be included. I'm just at this point, I have not been able to find anything in the records that says that, and I'm limited in my abilities to cheat with technology and put it, you know, if there's a 119 page PDF and you make it word searchable, you just put in the magic word and it helps the, the attorney greatly. Um, so that's, that's why there, there's this confusion and that's part of why I, I had to raise this issue was just at my first glance of those pages yesterday, I knew that something seemed off compared to what was previously provided. Okay. Any response? It has a heading, Your Honor. I'm not familiar with that heading in the documents that I was reviewing. I'll look for it again and I'll provide information. Okay. 
I appreciate y'all working together on that. So here's what we're going to do. Yes. Uh, we, had, we had told the state that we would bring in a printed copy, not the PDF, uh, this morning. But uh, Federal Express, which is the block away, for whatever reason, the road was being constructed. So they, they closed. So we were there at 8 o'clock to get the copy to the state we had promised. But we will bring one at lunch to hand the state. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. Any other argument with regard to the Richardson issue? Anything further, Mr. Beck? Okay. With regard to, let, let, me, let me conclude the Richardson analysis first. All right. Thank you both for your positions and your arguments. The court has, um, as a matter of law, the court needs to determine whether the defendant's violation was inadvertent or willful. Court finds that based on uh, the positions provided by the defense that the disclosure was inadvertent. But I do find that the violation had some level of substantiality to it. But due to the uh, state's review and the defense compliance with the court's order yesterday as to culling down to the pages that we've identified, the court finds that the violation had a limited ability on the state's ability to prepare for trial due to the lack of objections to the majority of the documents with the exception of page 48 and 26, which are sought to be included. Uh, for those reasons, I find that the prejudicial effect of the substantial disclosure is limited, uh, and I'm not going to um, order the defense, not going to prohibit the defense from proceeding forward on moving these items into evidence. However, I do want to address the uh, 403 rule of completeness issue with regard to paragraph or pages, excuse me, 26 and 49 as, excuse me, 26 and 48 as sought by the state. No objection, Mr. Beck. All right, thank you. So uh, the state's request is granted. Um, uh, pages 26 and 48 will be included um, uh, in any evidentiary documents that sought are sought to be uh, moved into evidence with regard to this January 23, 2018 incident as provided in the 119 pages of item two of the defendant's fifth amended reciprocal discovery exhibit list. I will not foreclose the state regarding um, page 68 of the 81 pages. If they are able to find that additional document, we can, um, we can address any argument at that time as to why that should be included. Anything further state before we bring in our jury? Judge, uh, the defense team has indicated to me that they intend on using demonstrative aids during opening statement. Um, the, the ones that I have seen include jury instructions that may not be given and may not be given in the way that the court gives, and photographs that could be coming into evidence. I identified at least one that I don't recognize as something they sought to be seeking into evidence, perhaps two. Um, so I believe we should have a discussion about each and every one of those. They should each be marked uh, for the record purposes uh, by letter so that we can refer to them and, and make a record. Um, I believe it's in the court's discretion, even though I rarely see it exercised in this way in this circuit, to allow uh, the respective parties to refer to actual exhibits during opening statements. Um, I would urge the court not to allow that. They're going to see them soon enough, um, but particularly with what they are seeking to introduce, given the motion and limine ruling that the court has already issued, that at this point in time, the latest proffer with the defendant's testimony is not amounting to an overt act that will result in a self-defense instruction, that will result in prior instances of violence coming in, um, that it would be extremely prejudicial, dangerous, and to use Mr. Cacciatore's analogy, very impossible to put that toothpaste back in the tube if we amplify our opening statements, which may or may not come to fruition when we start talking about these past instances and battered spouse syndrome, it would be greatly amplified if they're actually seeing exhibits um, of uh, the defendant's past injuries that she's attributing to the decedent. So I'm asking for us to discuss that response before we go through each photo. Judge, um, yeah, the defense is self-defense. Sarah's going to testify that she was defending herself. We believe the court's going to rule we're entitled to 
uh, put on a case involving self-defense. And uh, under the instruction for justifiable use of non-deadly force and the justifiable use of deadly force. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not discussing the jury instructions at this time. There are evidence of prior threats of prior events of violence committed under that instruction, under the self-defense justice. Here's my concern. Why are we addressing law in opening statement? Well, I agree with the state attorney. I did follow up a couple of these on the justifiable use of non-deadly force. That still that does not answer my question. I would agree not to, not to use those. Okay. No, I can see it, sir. And then the other one is a reasonable doubt is not under possible doubt, speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt is the standard instruction on using What's your position with regard to those two, Mr. J? Judge, it's opening statements. We should be discussing what we anticipate to come into the trial, and that's going to be enough of a minefield. Um, it really shouldn't be about the law. We'll both have an opportunity to use the actual jury instructions, which we have not decided upon. Um, we will have the opportunity to use that overhead or, or any means that we want at the end of the trial during our closings to put up what is actually decided to be the law after the case has been presented. Um, so it's our position that we shouldn't be using demonstrative aids with portions of jury instructions. We're going to have that opportunity to argue how the law applies to the facts at the end, and we will have the correct version. And if the court um, is following the tendency that I've seen in this circuit recently, we may, in fact, read three quarters of the jury instructions to them before we bring, even begin our closing remarks. I think it's premature and, and problematic to, to be doing that at this time, and it's not the, the role of opening remarks. Any other response? I've been doing this 35 years. I've had these boards. I've used these boards in opening statements. I don't know how many times. I'm, I've said that I would waive introducing the one specific to self-defense. But reasonable doubt is an instruction you gave to the jury uh, when we got started. And then this weighing the evidence is a standard jury instruction that applies in every case. Are those the standard? Is that the language of the standard instruction? I have not had the opportunity this morning to pull up the Florida standard criminal jury instructions off the Supreme Court website due to dealing with motions to eliminate, trying to prepare my opening statement, and doing all the things that I sh should be doing on the eve of openings. Um, but I did notice that I did not believe the reasonable doubt instruction was complete just from memory, and I know that's not the complete weighing the evidence um, instruction either. The, the, it's an entire page. Of, of instructions for each of those. Can I see the reasonable doubt instruction, please? Well, here's the first problem. That's the wrong instruction. Florida Supreme Court revised 3.7 earlier this year. That is not the appropriate definition of reasonable doubt. It is not what was read to the jury during jury selection. 3.7 now reads, Proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and it does not mean proof beyond all doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. That does not track the standard jury instruction. For those reasons, I'm not going to allow it. Judge, I'll have it redone in arguments. As long as it, I mean, we're, we're still in the process of working through. The 3.7 instruction speaks for itself. I won't preclude you from using enlargements in closing, but for the purposes of opening, because it doesn't track the 3.7 instruction, I'm not going to allow it. This is an excerpt from the wedding gift. Give me a moment.
That seems to be the standard 3.9 instructions, or at least portions of it. Response? Again, since it's not all of it, it's misleading. It's, it's highlighting something about the law when we're just talking about open remarks, opening remarks. Six through ten are optional. We haven't decided which out of the optional instructions six to ten we're going to use in this case because we have not heard the evidence yet. So I just think it's inappropriate to be delving into pieces and portions of jury instructions before we get the evidence. What we should be doing is explaining to the jury what we believe the facts are going to show and the inferences that they can draw from them uh, and, and argue the law later. Last bite at the apple, sir. Judge, they, they've got to have some guidance to the law. You know, that in many ways, we do it where we give them the law at the very end, you know, and I understand the reason for that, depending on the evidence that comes in, but there's standard instructions that are going to apply throughout, and this is just giving them an idea of what their role is in considering the credibility of witnesses. I think it's appropriate. It's a brief statement of a standard instruction that comes in on every case. Let me move to the photographs before I address the 3.9 issue. I think for the record, we, we should mark them. Okay. Do you want them marked? You want them marked by Madam Clerk, correct? Okay, so let's approach with that first photograph, please. Sure. Madam Clerk, yes.
record, this is uh, identified as A, Defendant's Exhibit A, the purposes of a demonstrative aiding or opening statement. This is a picture of Sarah Boone that was taken by law enforcement on one of the incidents involving the <coughs> arrest. And uh, as you can see, there's a letter right here, which we believe is relevant and admissible. Any other further argument with regard to the use of those items pre-marked as A through I in opening statement? Mr. Owens. Yes, Mr. Judge, and I sent you some cases. When did you send it, sir? I have not received it. I think 
we were already on the bench, so we sent it to the clerk and the jail. Has the state seen a copy of it? I'm familiar with the case law. I did receive the email. Um, I'm not sure if it indicated who all was copied on it, or a separate one, but I'll check. This is just these two cases. I've been provided Al Seguer v. State, 326 Southern 3rd, 656, Florida Supreme Court, 2021. Low v. State, 259, Southern 3rd, 23, Florida Supreme Court, 2018. Yes, sir. Judge, the court has discretion to allow demonstrative aids. If you look at one or both of those, there was a, a state wanted to introduce a dummy they were using in a homicide case, which uh, the court allowed. Other, other cases have allowed photographs and demonstrative aids to be used in opening statements. In the uh, Alcagir case, which is the 2021 case, Supreme Court, trial court acted within its discretion in permitting state's use of a map as a demonstrative aid during the guilt phase rebuttal closing argument in a capital murder trial where evidence visually demonstrated on the map was not without support in the record. That was actually an exhibit that was in the record. The 2018 case, Supreme Court of Florida, again, the trial court acted within its discretion in allowing a demonstrative exhibit. In that case, uh, it was a murder prosecution. The trial court acted within its discretion in allowing the state to use a mannequin and a demonstrative aid in order to show the position of the gun in relation to the victim's body. The mannequin was used to set out the circumstances of the crime and to attempt to establish aggravation. The mannequin was used to demonstrate the location of the gunshot wounds, the angle of the impact against the skin, the incapacitating nature of each gunshot wound, advising of the trajectories were anatomical, not spatial, and had a small degree of error where only was slight difference between the victim size and the mannequin's dimensions. There was nothing to suggest the mannequin was altered to resemble the victim. Court allowed, again, the court's discretion. As you know, we're claiming self-defense, and as part of that instruction, we're entitled to allege prior instances of difficulties and prior acts of violence so that the defendant who asserts self-defense, their state of mind is different from the norm. Take the two instructions you read. By the Sarah Boone, who because of prior threats or difficulties with George Torres, had reasonable grounds to believe that she was in danger of imminent use of unlawful force at the hands of George Torres, you may consider this fact in determining whether the actions of Sarah Boone were those of a reasonable person. They're demonstrative aids to aid the jury in understanding the circumstances surrounding that relationship and the actions that Sarah took and the reasonableness of those actions in light of their history. Thank you. Any response, State? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Judge, the standard is... Um, it is your discretion, and you will only be uh, reversed if you abuse your discretion in this regard. The state is urging you just flat out, as a matter of principle, uh, to not allow the parties to go into the exhibits uh, during opening statements. 
they're going to be seeing the actual exhibits in the very, very near future. Um, I mean, we can do this. We, we can play the videos. We can show gruesome autopsy photographs on the big screen as well during opening statements, but those things are all coming. Um, so we're just asking you first in general, let's, let's not extend the opening statements in that regard any more than necessary. Now our specific objections uh, are this. With A, which is beneath everything now, but the bloody ear from the prior incident, I believe that is from a body-worn camera, and I think he indicated as much it was not from her phone. If we get to that point where we know that this piece of evidence is coming in, that would be one thing. But right now, the law of the case is they cannot put on uh, any evidence of prior instances of violence, any reputation evidence regarding the victim, or go into battered spouse syndrome uh, in the evidence until self-defense has been established, and that self-defense must be established by the testimony, and in this particular case, it has to come from the defendant, of an overt act taken by the decedent, uh, which resulted in an imminent threat of great bodily harm or death, and we have had that litigation. We have provided the court the most recent testimony uh, regarding the defendant's most recent statements from the two doctors, and that it doesn't exist at this time. So it's one thing for the parties to go into things and in opening statements um, that don't end up coming into evidence. And when the defendant does that, well, under King versus State, the state gets to point out, look, they made these promises in opening statements and they didn't come to fruition. So you need to disregard everything that you heard that was going to happen in trial uh, that didn't. But the problem, particularly for the state side, is we don't, we don't get to appeal. So if we go through opening statements and we have the jurors not only exposed to our words about things that may or may not be coming into evidence, but exposed to a thousand words per picture, if a picture is worth a thousand words, that amplifies the error. And it's an error the state has no remedy to fix. So we're asking for A, which um, would absolutely come into evidence. If, if we get this overt act uh, testimony, um, which has not occurred yet from the defendant, um, and certainly this is A would come in. Um, and, and some of the other letters. And there's nothing wrong with them blowing it up like that. In fact, the state has it on their exhibit and, and will be showing it on the screen as well. There's, there's not you know, a lot of dispute over whether that will come in if we meet that uh, standard of an imminent act uh, or an overt threat of an imminent act of danger. B, I'm not sure um, B was on their list of items that they sought to introduce um, from the phone. Um, we would argue a picture of her with her dogs on her porch doesn't have any relevance. I don't expect that to be coming into trial, so we're objecting on that separate ground. And then returning back to C, D, E, F, G, H, I. State is all aware of those photographs. We are prepared to introduce them ourselves. Um, through the digital evidence, there's no hiding those things. If we meet the threshold for this sort of evidence coming in. Could you identify those for me? I'm trying to keep notes contemporaneously. Yes, C. It was C through I inclusive. Yes. Thank you. B is the only one that is not a, a, a photograph of prior violence. It's, I don't know, it wasn't on their list of things that they sought to introduce and um, I don't know what the relevance would be of her just sitting there on her porch with their dogs. But A and then C through I, judge absolutely at the end of the trial, great. Blow them up, use them as, as much as you want. But th in this particular case, with the rulings that the court has already made about this, based on the state's motion in limine, it is very dangerous to allow them to do this when we are not expecting uh, it to be admitted into evidence based on the current state of the defendant's testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Owens, if you could address Exhibit B, it was pre-marked as B. But, Judge, you've already ruled that these things come in and open. Remember that problem? No, what I ruled was is that you were able to discuss them, you address them in opening. Photographs are a totally different kitty. 
I, I said nothing about battered spouse syndrome. I said self-defense. Just these exhibits come in under self-defense. In arguing these, I've said nothing about battered spouse. Talk, I'm talking about self-defense. I understand. And prior, prior difficulties, prior acts of violence is a standard instruction. But the overt act requirement remains. I mean, we've reviewed Holland and read it in multiple faith, times. In good faith, with discussions with my client, we believe there is going to be evidence of an overt act. And she was facing imminent threat, and she reacted based on that threat. Understood. Your response to Exhibit B. Now, I look at B. Which one's B? It's the, her on the back porch with the two dogs. Judge. Not only did he abuse, more store is abused. That's not the issue. The issue is that the state represented that it was not part of your exhibit list. I, I, I believe it is a part of the exhibit list. We got this from the state. Okay. Uh, this was a that they sent over as a bunch of pictures of flowers or paintings that they want to introduce that they listed as exhibits. I thought for sure we put this on there, but uh, the relevance of it is not only did he abuse Sarah Boone, George Cornish, he abused the dogs. And he would threaten to abuse the dogs to control Sarah Boone. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. They're checking, Judge. All right. The court's prepared to rule at this point in time. Thank you both for your presentations and your argument. The court's had the opportunity to what was uh, pre-marked as A through I inclusive. First, with regard to the portion of the 3.9 instruction, the purposes of opening statement is to set the table of what the issues are, what the parties believe the facts and evidence will show. It is not a proper time to be discussing law or elements of law, and that is an element of law that will be instructed to the jury at the end of the case. So the court's going to exercise its discretion for those reasons and prohibit you from using the portion of the 3.9 instruction and opening statement. You could talk about this is a job that you're going to have, but I'm not going to allow you to read portions of the instruction for those reasons at this time. With regard to what was pre-marked as A through I, uh, the Holland case is clear. Before a defendant may introduce evidence of the victim's character, he must first show that there was an overt act by the victim at or about the time of the incident that reasonably indicated a need for self-defense. I understand your good faith belief. I take no position on whether or not you're going to make it or not. That's something that you're going to have to establish. But the concern um, is that the photographs, some of them are graphic in nature. Uh, the, the lacerations, the sutures, the bruising, facial wounds with bleeding may have such a impact such that the toothpaste cannot be paced back into the tube, assuming that overt act hurdle is not met. The court, again, takes no position on whether or not you're going to be able to meet it because I haven't heard the evidence and testimony. So uh, court's going to exercise its discretion for those reasons. You can talk about it. You can talk about it, that she was a, a victim. You can talk about specific, uh, some incidences made happen, but I'm not going to allow the photographs at this point in time for those reasons, for your utilization of them in opening statements. Any questions or clarifications with regards to the court's ruling state? No, Your Honor. Defense? No, sir. All right, are we prepared to bring in our jury at this time? I've got two other issues. They've been waiting for an hour and 20 minutes, Counselor. <clears throat> we intend to play the two-minute suitcase video to the jury in opening statement. State? Again, I'm asking you to urge your discretion. They're going to hear it in the next two days of court. Um, it's within your discretion whether we're going to start using exhibits during opening statement. Okay. What's the other issue, sir? I need to approach eventually. Okay. With regard to the video, I'm not going to allow proposed exhibits to be used in opening statements. It's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. I'm not going to allow your photographs, I'm not going to allow the state to do anything. You can orally talk about what you believe the evidence and testimony is going to show, but the actual evidence is going to have to be presented here through witnesses or through demonstration and publication after that evidence is admitted. You all can approach. While we approach, can somebody from their team start dismantling? Please, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Any reason why we cannot bring in our jury at this time? State? No, sir. Defense? No, sir. All right, let's stand and bring in our panel. Good morning. Y'all may be seated. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. Yeah. Right, can the parties approach for a moment? 
All right, members of our jury, good morning. Uh, I want to just confirm before we start this morning that you complied with the court's instructions last night to not have any conversations amongst yourselves or anyone else about the persons, places, things, or charge involved in this case. And then you have not conducted any independent investigation regarding those items. You just raise your hands to confer that you complied with the court's instructions. All right, the record will reflect that all jurors have raised their hands. Members of the jury, uh, Yesterday, I told you that you may happen to see the lawyers in the courtroom or in the courthouse going about their affairs. And again, they're not trying to avoid you um, or speak to you because they're not allowed to. Did anyone happen to ride an elevator this morning with any of the attorneys, either for the state or for the defense? All right, juror in seat number three from my left, first row. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Can you approach for a moment? And a juror in seat four, left to right, first row. Yes, sir, who did you ride the elevator with? Do you recall who specifically, sir? Mr. Owens. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you both for your honesty. I appreciate that. It's something we talked about earlier this week. That's the one thing that we were required and asked of you is just be open and honest. And I appreciate both of y'all's uh, open and honesty. During the riding the elevator, was there anything that you saw or observed that it would impacted you or influenced you in any way to have any impact on you? Juror number three, left to right, first row. Juror number four, left to right, first row. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, um, members of the jury, we're gonna proceed with opening statements this morning. Both the state and the defense will have the opportunity to present them. I ask that you listen closely to those statements that they're gonna provide. But remember, these are not evidence. This is just the party's belief as to what the facts and the evidence will show in this case. After the conclusion of the opening statements, we'll be bring, begin with the state's case in chief through witnesses. With that, Mr. Jay, you may proceed, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, what the evidence in this case is going to show you is that this defendant zipped Jorge George Torres shot in a suitcase. She was able to do this because at the time of his death, he only weighed 103 pounds. And she did this with the malicious intent to punish him. And then she went up to sleep and left him to take his final breaths on this earth alone. How many breaths those were, we don't know. The evidence is going to show that it was at least for about 15 minutes, because there's going to be two videos, that the defendant herself took of this event. The evidence is going to show George Torres is dead because in this defendant's judgment, he deserved it. And out of a conscious disregard for whether he lived or died, you will see and hear these videos. What I expect you will hear from a video that began at 11.12 p.m. 45 seconds on February 23rd, 2020 in Orange County, Florida is a suitcase on the ground face down with the zippers facing the floor. You will hear Sarah the defendant will say, for everything you've done to me. Sarah, for everything you've done to me. Sarah, fuck you. And then the defendant laughs. Sarah, fuck you. And the defendant laughs. Sarah, stupid. Sarah, that's my name. Don't wear it out. Sarah, I can't fucking breathe, baby, seriously. Yeah, that's what you do when you choke me. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. The defendant laughs again. Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. She laughs again. That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe. She laughs again. Unintelligible words. And I would submit the evidence is going to show, because of the intoxication from alcohol, 
is the next thing she says. Sarah, Sarah, S Sarah, I can't breathe, baby. That's what I feel like when you cheat on me. Sarah, fuck you. I can't fucking breathe, Sarah. You should probably shut the fuck up. Sarah, shh, is the last thing you will hear the defendant say to Mr. Torres as he is face down, zipped shut in a suitcase. That, again, began at 11, 12, 45 and lasts just over two minutes. At 11, 23 and three seconds PM, there's a second 22 second video and it's the defendant zooming in on the suitcase. And all you hear during this 22 seconds after he's been in this suitcase since at least 11, 12 p.m. is one more time, Sarah. How did we get to this point where 103 pound George Torres is put into this suitcase left to die? Well, the next morning, the defendant wakes up, late morning, perhaps early afternoon, somewhere in this time range, several hours later. And she goes downstairs, and she doesn't see Ford anywhere, just Torres, and eventually realizes, oh my god. First thing she does after taking him out, and I believe you will hear a description by the defendant saying, he took his middle legs out. At some point she makes that statement. And tries to resuscitate him. Here's gurgling as she presses down on his 103 pound chest, forcing whatever air was trapped in there out with the gurgling. Then the next thing she does is she doesn't call 911. She calls Brian Boone. Who's Brian Boone? Well, Brian Boone is her ex-husband. They share a child in common. And this date, February 24th, 2020, is a Monday. A normal work day for most people. School day for their child that they share in common. But after they got divorced, the arrangement was every other weekend, no co-parent. And that weekend included Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's got three scheduled. And then Monday through Tuesdays, their child would be her responsibility. And Wednesdays and Thursdays, their child would be Mr. Brian Boone's responsibility. So February 23rd, 2020 was a Sunday. Now he's led into Monday. Mr. Boone had been trying actually to contact the defendant several times that morning because he just wanted to confirm she was going to get their child after school that day. And there had been a history of reliability issues on that, on that issue on her part. So you will see in the phone record. He calls her and calls her and calls her. Then she finally calls him back instead of calling 911. And being the nice co-parent that he is, he comes over. It's a short drive, about 10 minutes. And as she's explaining to him what the heck is going on, he peeks in through the front door of her townhouse, which allows you a view all the way to the back sliding glass door. You're going to see that her kitchen is off to the right. There's a doorway that you can see all the way through. And on the back side of the kitchen in the breakfast room area, there's tables and stuff. There's also some blue legs sticking out in view. Brian Boone says, check please. You need to call 911. He doesn't put set foot into that townhouse. He does wait outside though, being the good partner that he has. So now, after having first called her ex-husband, after having first waited for Brian Boone to come over, 
the defendant makes the 911 call. What you will not hear are tears. You will not hear sorrow. You will hear a certain level of concern. My boyfriend and I were playing last night. Put him in a suitcase and we were playing hide and seek kind of thing. I fell asleep, found him dead in the suitcase this morning. I don't know what happened. He had blood coming out of his mouth. Don't know if it was an aneurysm. Pulled him out of the suitcase, tried to give him CPR. He was in the suitcase and I fell asleep. He's not awake, he's purple, he's not breathing. There's some instructions about how to do CPR given to her, asking about whether an AED uh, is available to, to shock his heart. It's too late, he's cold, he's stiff, he's purple. We were playing hide and seek. We were playing hide and seek. This is horrible, this is horrific what happened. Like what happened? We were playing hide and seek last night and I fell asleep. She mentions that there was blood coming out of his mouth. And his body, like all bodies in his death, was taken to the Ninth District Medical Examiner's Office in autopsy. <laughs> what the doctor found was what you would expect after being left in a suitcase, a couple of other deal position. He passed from positional asphyxiation, meaning like you're not going to get full breaths when you're crumpled up like an accordion, and environmental suffocation. You don't have to have a plastic bag over your head, tape shut with a full roll of duct tape to seal it off 100% and be worthy of the vacuum of space to environmentally suffocate. It's, it's close enough if you can't get the oxygen and the CO2 coming in and out of your environment. But she also did notice, yeah, he, he suffered from blunt force trauma on his torso, in his face, his mouth. She'll use more to will help her explain confusions and bruises. She'll use words like hematomas. We'll, we'll help her understand for you all that that means bleeding under the skin and blood. It's like you know, expect to improve. That's why they're running you. But he had all this additional trauma. He had trauma on his fingers as well. So now, the Sheriff's Office, Orange County Fire Rescue show up. And the defendant interacts with the first patrol officer. You will see and hear that body worn camera. And it's more of the same as what we heard on the 911 call. It was like hide and seek. It was good. I, just, I fell asleep. I don't know what happened. A few hours later, the detectives from the homicide unit of the Orange County Sheriff's Office approach her and are ready to interview her after doing some initial things, which includes grabbing her cell phone. Um, off of the uh, counter that was found by the suitcase of Mr. Flores, and giving it to one of their digital forensic examiners, who we'll hear from later in the trial, Janelle Warren. But it's time to give a first interview with the defendant. So they do a first interview with the defendant in one of their unmarked detective patrol cars there on the scene. And the basics of this remain the same, but there's a little more elaboration as you would expect from trained detectives uh, versus getting the 911 call taken. But the basics of what the defendant tells them is we had wine, <coughs> we painted, we drew, we did puzzles. The particular wine we had was a Chardonnay from the Woodbridge uh, Winery. The bottles, plural, are in the trash. We started about 4 p.m. after uh, Mr. Torres went to the store. Puzzles, art, listening to music, enjoying each other's company. We were just literally just enjoying one another's company. The other bottle of wine that was left over from Boer wasn't even half full. So the description she is saying is one bottle of wine and plus a fraction of a bottle of wine left over from the night before. Ladies and gentlemen, not all bottles of wine are made the same. Many of us may envision uh, what you would expect at a restaurant. Those are 750s, 750 milliliters of that. 
bottles of wine that were recovered from the defendant's trash can were 1.5 liters, so the equivalent of two standard bottles of wine. A 1.5 liter bottle of wine is 50 ounces, given that a standard serving of wine is five ounces, you can begin to do the math. And there's receipts. The day before, Saturday, February 22nd, 2020, there is a receipt from Publix for a bottle of Woodbridge wine for $9.74. And then Sunday at 12.17 p.m., there is another receipt for $9.74 for a Woodbridge Chardonnay bottle of wine. And then at about 5.30 in the afternoon on February 23rd, again, there is another receipt for the same bottle of wine for the same price. And those two bottles of wine were recovered. They're going to be produced to you in evidence, and you will see that they are, in fact, magnum bottles of wine. So that's the context of, that we're dealing with when we hear things like, we only had one bottle of wine, and we finished what was left in the bottle of wine from before. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's two 1.5 liters that apparently were consumed by a 103-pound man and the defendant who is in the same weight class. Plus, if you believe that the defendant and the decedent would leave leftover wine from any given day, any additional wine that was remaining from the 1.5 liters from Saturday. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a lot of wine. So in that context, we were just having wine enjoying each other's company. At one point we play hide and seek. She says she didn't zip it up all the way. There was enough room, in her words again, there was enough room for his little fingers to get out. We were still having a good time and whatever. And basically, you know, Mr. Torres is stressing out about jobs, his ex-wife, about money. And so they're just doing puzzles and doing things to keep his mind off of it doing art, playing with the dogs, dancing with the dogs, playing hide and seek. We were always trying to outdo each other where we could find each other the best. When they started playing hide and seek, she went up to the shower and then got tired of hanging out in the shower and came down and that's when she found him playing around in the suitcase. We both thought it was funny. I'm gonna zip you up. Two little fingers could stick out. And she went upstairs thinking, he'll get out, we're gonna have sex and go to sleep and call it a day. It was a good day. She insists that they had wine but were not drunk. You will be able to assess that for yourselves when you hear the recording she made. No ill will between us last night. Last argument, maybe last week. Don't really argue. We came home, drink, smoke, did art, listen to music, play with the dogs. We drink what we can afford. We used to be able to afford liquor, but now we can only afford wine. And that's how that day ends with the police. She goes and sleeps and stays at her ex-husband's house the night of February 24th and the 25th. What they are doing, and by they I mean Orange County Sheriff's Office, in part, is going to her car. That's when they discover the two videos that I just described for you. And there's other things in the phone, which I will discuss with you in a little bit. But uh, she's summoned in for another interview, and she sits down and gives another interview on February 25th, now Tuesday. She does describe past instances of violence. You're going to hear about that. She's going to say, Mr. Torres had hit her with a curtain rod about a month ago. Since then though, like we've been good. I've been good. She describes that he comes at, him, comes at her all the time. He comes at me. So it's either I flee or I try to go upstairs and go to sleep. That's usually what it is. I don't know if you talk to uh, Brian, her husband, about any of that, but most of the time I, I flee and I go over there. There's a discussion about why she stays with him, and you'll hear that for yourself. 
she will say that she doesn't really want to drink. She just takes an occasional drink. She drinks to placate him, Mr. Torres. She says that you're going to see phone videos of Mr. Torres smashing her TV in the past, like a month earlier. You may see that too. But she doesn't get drunk. When she drinks, she likes being non compos mentis, her words, not mine, having her wits about herself. Then she gets to the hide and seek again and describes that they've played it three times before, but had never zipped one another shut in it before. And they were really just running out of places to hide because it's just a town home. She does not remember, according to her, she does not remember taking any photos or videos of the night's events. At this point, they ask her, well, would you like to see it? And she says, I can't watch this. I flipped him over, I flipped him over, and that's where it was. Guys, this is killing me right now. That's why I flipped it over between the two videos. I, I didn't do anything intentional. Discussion over whether he had too, or enough room to get any of his fingers out from the zipper. My intention was not to leave him there. We both got in there. Both of us were in there. When she went upstairs, my plan was not to, quote, he'll be up here any minute. My plan wasn't to leave him in the suitcase. Why is all this going on? It's the drinking. That's what it is. It's the drinking. I thought it was like I thought he was okay. Guys, that's, that's how we were with each other. Nobody understands our relationship. This whole suitcase thing never happened before, though she described it happening before. I'll never drink alcohol again. She insists that she has no injuries on her. And you don't have to take her word for it because they took photographs of her and there were no injuries on her. She insists over and over that there was no violence that day. It's like, okay, we're in a good place right now. They ask her about saying fuck you to Mr. Torres. Well, that's just being playing playful and having a good day. Everybody's having a good day. I didn't touch him, nor did he touch me. Her words. What else is found on her phone? There's a conversation between uh, Mr. Torres's brother, and again, Nobody knows who's using these phones at the time text messages are sent in these records that you're going to see. But it's indicated that there is a communication between one of the decedent's brothers and the owner of the phone that was taken that belongs to Ms. Boone. The text from the brother is, yo, my daughter told me what you did, Sarah. I don't want you around any of my daughters or nieces and nephews. And that's Christmas 2019, just under two months before this event. She replies, or the person using her device at this time, Ugh, your quote unquote dad hit me in the face. The next text is, Hide and seek, I shall. January 13th, there's another heated discussion. She describes it on January 13th in a text uh, to Mo, the brother again. It's a Torres thing. Boo sends a picture. Keep the fugly creep out to. It's still fugly. Lose. The brother responds, please do something with yourself, Sarah. God bless you. The defendant's response, and bless you and all of you too. I'll get in all capitals, rid of him. Then it'll be, in all capitals, better. Ugh, Torres, referring to Mr. Torres, getting rid of. And 
And that's the case. That's what the evidence is going to show. But we, the state of Florida, and the members of the jury in our journey through this case, we're all going to come up to a door that says, danger, keep out, stay away, by court order. And that door says, the defendant's history with the victim. It is a door we shall not enter without permission and invitation. Halloween in like 13 days. Part of the vampire lore is vampires can't come get you in your house. Well, I anticipate during this trial, we're going to be invited in to the defendant's past relationship for the previous couple of years with Mr. Forrest. And as we come inside this room, at her beckoning, we're going to have things pointed out that she would like us to focus on. And you're going to hear the first night the defendant met the decedent, Mr. Torres, he smashes her phone, punches her. It's the first time in her life she'd ever been punched, I expect the testimony would be. And he made her curl up in a fetal position on her own porch for four hours. And she was only able to escape this situation when he fell asleep. I expect that you're going to hear that Mr. Torres is an alcoholic. I expect you may hear his high score on his blood alcohol level was a 3-4-2 once when he got treated at the hospital. This is a man who had serious alcohol problems, and I expect you're going to hear about that. Despite that first date, and this is going to tie into some other things that I expect could possibly come in. Despite that first date, despite at that point in time of this first date not having a relationship, emotional ties, and the things that come along with a relationship that make it harder to break off a relationship, it's one thing to have a bad first date, it's another thing to end a 25-year marriage. Despite that first date, there's a second and a third. Now, these days are at bars, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, and it just typically ends up, she's going to tell you, I suspect, or you're going to hear that she said, one way or another. It's one thing or the other. Like, I ask a dude for a cigarette, Mr. Torres flips out, and I'm going to pay the price. Just things like that. And you're going to hear and potentially see, yes, there were injuries that the defendant is going to attribute to the victim causing her. Black eyes, cuts in the face, perhaps from the curtain rod incident that was mentioned in the police interview that happened about a month before this. Bloody ear, a stab wound in the leg, which is perhaps described as sword fighting and playing around in that clip. But nonetheless, I suspect you're going to hear and see a lot about their past history. And at the end, if this occurs, if this comes in, the state is going to have the opportunity to take the lead of the tour in this room, labeled the defendant and the victim's past history. And I'm not going to go into that now. <coughs> If this all comes to fruit, the fruit blooms on the tree during the trial, we'll discuss it at the end where it's more appropriate. But I'm asking you to not rush to judgment until you hear all of the evidence in the case. And then apply whether or not these past instances have anything to do with what happened on February 23rd. Now, like a home inspector, there, there are experts to come in and kind of help walk everybody through this room, label the defendant and the victim's past relationship. I suspect there, there's a chance 
you may hear from some experts, psychologists and psychiatrists, about battered spouse syndrome. The state is not challenging in any way that battered spouse syndrome exists. It's well recognized, the experts will tell you all about it. Not disputing that at all. But there's some things that we would hope that you pay attention to during all the testimony, if there is any, about this subject matter. One is that it's not actually a recognized diagnosis in the Bible that they use in mental health called dsm 5 r Diagnostic Statistical Manual, version 5, and I think it's text revision or something like that. What it is, and what they describe it as, is kind of a component of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. But because it's not actually in the book, it's like a recipe book. It's like our statute books for lawyers. You go into this book and say you have a, you know, a particular disorder or diagnosis, it'll say, well, all of us agree that it means these three elements, like elements of crime, some of these elements have to be prevalent for a certain amount of time, so on and so forth. You imagine it's a cookbook. Gives you the recipe for a diagnosis. But because there's no, it's not in the cookbook, you may get some disagreement about what it means between the experts, because it's kind of like grandma's recipe handed down from generation to generation without being right. But what I expect you'll hear is, you know, it's it's important for people who don't have experience in certain abusive relationships that are violent to understand the control that can be exerted over an intimate partner by the other one, isolation, psychological violence, emotional violence, physical violence, sexual violence, which I suspect will be described for you as well by the defendant, perpetrated on her by the deceased. You'll hear about all this. And what it ties into at the end of the day, after we talk about this during the selection, is if there is a self-defense instruction read to you, this is to help you understand what an objective and reasonable person in the circumstances would do. Because years ago, we've gotten better as a society, but years ago when this was first being research, the question would be, well, why, why wouldn't you leave? And that spouse syndrome and the testimony from these experts help explain those things to people. Well, it's not that easy. You gotta look at what's going on in the relationship, the isolation, the control, so on and so forth. And that explains why you wouldn't leave. Well now, but, but turning to the facts of our case, what you're going to decide the facts are is ordinary, objective reasonable person in those circumstances taking those actions if you get a self-defense instruction in part of that. That's what it's used for. It's not used for explaining the subjective belief that one holds. What you will also hear about these things is, just like any other doctor or any expert, like a home inspector. If a home inspector's report was based solely on the person who's trying to sell a house, what they say about the shape. I rewired the entire thing. Brand new JDC pipes. This sucker's good to go. It's I'm afraid of this is not that You're not going to take that home inspector's report unless they lift the hood, take the tires, do all the things that the fox on the car does. You want an expert to, to get reliable information. And an expert's opinion is only as good as the information that he or she relies on. They will say, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take into account the credibility of the person who's giving the, the story. Even if it's the patient, or the client that is saying, all these things happen to you. You gotta find proper information. You gotta check reliability. Particularly um, in circumstances that we've discussed in the case. So, another thing that they're going to tell you is, just because there's a bunch of violent nonsense going on between two intimate partners doesn't mean that a spouse syndrome applies. Some people can go home and fight like cats and dogs, and 
that's just their day, and they get over it, they live their life, and find another thing. Their cycle just spins like that. So just because you hear about those things, what the experts will tell you, it doesn't mean that it necessarily applies. If this is testimony, then I expect that Dr. Hart would say that it applies to the school. Um, but we'll talk to her about what she relied upon to, to make that conclusion. We'll talk to her about some other things and take that journey together. But at the end of the day, after you hear all of the evidence in this case, particularly straight from the horse's mouth, the video, where you don't have to rely upon the credibility of anything other than your own two eyes and your own two ears, the state's meant that you're going to return a guilty verdict for second degree murder. What the evidence is going to show is that the defendant killed Mr. Torres because she decided he deserved it. Not because the evidence will show an objective, reasonable person in her circumstances needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jay. Any opening remarks by the defense? Judge, can we invoke the rule? It has been. I've already advised the witnesses. Okay, the rule of sequestration will be invoked. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you may proceed, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Appreciate y'all being here. I was introduced before. My name is James Owens, and I represent Sarah Bennett, along with Tony Henderson and Kevin Bennett. Now, this is going to be a several day talk. Obviously, today, the is going to be, well, not sure, but trying to make um, arrangements for witnesses to find expert witnesses and whatnot. And we'll know more probably at the end of the day or in the month or so you can plan. But I know your focus is on this case because you took a note to do Ladies and gentlemen, there is no higher call than the right of man. No higher call than the right of man. And we're going to ask you to end the case if the right is wrong. We find Sarah Bloom not guilty because she was justified in the force that she used to defend herself. If that force was reasonable, under the circumstances that existed between Sarah Boone and George Torres. Sarah Boone and George Torres were down and out, as you can be. Their life centered around alcohol. Both of them suffered from used to be called alcoholism, now it's called alcohol abuse syndrome. And so day to day, they struggle with the use of alcohol. You can imagine that. It affected their jobs. It affected keeping employment. It affected even getting a job. as codependent as you can be towards each other. And you're going to learn with all that was domestic violence. And that George Torres physically abused Sarah Boone. And she suffered from the effects the psychological effects that one suffers from repeat <coughs> violence from an intimate partner. They were together over three years, and there were several prior incidences of violence. We've got the photographs. There were incidences where police were called who took photographs. So you're going to be able to see the evidence. 
and believe we believe the court will instruct you at the end when you're considering self-defense, which we call justifiable use of non-deadly force or justifiable use of deadly force, that you can consider the prior acts, the history of violence, the prior difficulties that the parties had, in considering her set of circumstances that she was faced with in making the decision to use reasonable force under the circumstances. And the most important thing I can tell you here today is keep an open mind. There's two sides to every story. You're going to hear the state's side, them attempting to paint her a certain way, as they've done here today in opening statement. And then you're going to hear another side. And you're going to have to weigh that. All the evidence, the credibility of the witnesses, the photographs, the videotapes, and come to a conclusion. Now let's talk about this day, February 23rd of 2020, the date of this event. This, this case has been pending for some time. Here we are, October of 2024. I think the evidence is going to show that they had purchased some wine the day before, but they hadn't finished all of that. So it was in the refrigerator. Many times that's how they start their day. At some point, you're going to see a video from Publix, from where they live. I believe it's Winter Park. But Publix was not too far from their apartment complex. And they took their car, they drove over there. So you're going to see a videotape from Publix of them both going in the store about noon. And they come out with one of these larger bottles of the wine. And then, of course, uh, there's a receipt. And the bottles are in the garbage can. Of course, there obviously is an attraction between the two. And as everybody knows, um, couples can have great times where things click, everybody gets along, and then we can have episodes of disagreement. And how are those resolved? Really, is what this is about. How are disagreements resolved? But George was very jealous of Sarah. And you're going to hear the testimony about that and that he cannot, in certain situations, he can be very charming. But when his level of intoxication gets to a certain level, it's when he gets sad, moody, and a lot of times eventually it involves forcible sex with Sarah Boone or actual physical violence against her. They bought the wine. It's a simple life. They don't have much money. Uh, but they both like art. They did that for a while. They both like puzzles. They did that for a while. Well, about five or so, the wine bottle was gone. And George had said, I want to go get some cigarettes. So there's a convenience store right close by their apartment complex. And, and Sarah thought he was just going to walk over there and get cigarettes and come back. But no, what he did was he, he got her keys, he got her debit card, and he went over to the Publix and he got another bar. And I think that was about five, five thirty, something like that. And again, there'll be the Publix video showing him going in, going out, and there'll be a receipt for the purchase of that bottle, and then there'll be that bottle. It will be in the garbage can along with the other bottle. Well, when he comes in with the second bottle, Sarah, Sarah knows this is not good. She knows this means he's going to get to another level of intoxication. So, Sarah's concerned. 
Um, <coughs> attempts to placate him, keep him busy, keep him in a good mood. They drink that bottle, or she drinks as well. And at some point, they're intoxicated at a high level. As some people do when they're drunk, they get silly. And they decide to play a game of hide and seek. She goes upstairs, their bedroom's upstairs, to the shower and waits for a period of time. And he doesn't come to her. <coughs> At some point she gets cold, she gets tired. She wants to go see, well, maybe, maybe we've got it mixed up. Where is he? So she goes downstairs, and they had gotten a suitcase down a week or so ago. It's an old suitcase uh, that they were going to donate to Helping Hands or Goodwill or somebody, and they were putting some items in there. And it's a broken down suitcase. It's a large suitcase. They both weigh about 100 pounds. Uh, and they don't eat good. Mal malnourished to a large degree. Um, but the pool handle has broken off. And they've attached a little uh, paper clip that's got the rubber around it. And that's how they move it back and forth. Well, she comes down the steps, she sees him getting in and settling in the suitcase. So she walks over there and you know they see each other, they smile and laugh, and she she zips him up. And she zips him up and they laugh for a while. And they carry on, she sits on the couch, and at some point he says, I can't move. Now his face is facing the zipper, and she's got, she's got two or three inches that she's opened it. And she doesn't know. They're intoxicated. She doesn't know whether he's just saying that to try to get her to get him out or what. But he's a captive audience. Physically, they're the same size, but he, he's much stronger than her. If they got in a fist fight, he would win a hundred times out of a hundred. But she's got him now. He claims he can't get up. He has to sit and listen. It's a unique form of physical restraint. And so she lets him have it. Says things she shouldn't say. You'll see the video. It's about two minutes long. She videotapes it. She sits on the couch and turns her phone on and videotapes it for about two minutes. There's another video that's approximately 11 minutes later. The first video, George is, the, the suitcase is flipped upside down. The zippers are off. Eleven minutes later, Sarah has flipped it right side up. Again, open for him to get out. And it's only 22 seconds. And you hear George say, Sarah. And that's it. Now the key to the case is that 11 minutes. And what happened during that 11 minutes. Okay? That is the key to this case. Sarah Boone will take the stand. She will explain what happened. She will explain why it happened. The evidence will show that she was justified in the action she took to prevent an attack from George Torres, which the law acknowledges that every one of us has a right to invoke, the right of self-defense.
You're going to hear from the medical examiner. She is going to tell you about some bruising on George Torres. Of course, he was in the suitcase a while, deceased, we believe. And that changes things a little bit, as the medical examiner will explain. But there's some bruising. Sarah's going to explain that to you. Why that happened. What were the circumstances surrounding that? Involving that. Her son comes and stays with him from time to time. He has his own room. He has several of his things there. And there's a bat downstairs. The same bat that George Torres used, and there's a video where George is threatening Sarah. And he's swinging the bat at the TV about as hard as he can. And he does it about six or seven times. You'll see it. Sarah's recording it. And it's during an argument. And he's trying to intimidate her. Sarah loved you. You know, you're going to hear why. Why women don't leave? Why women don't leave? And you're going to hear about Sarah Boone and her struggles, her mental health struggles. Sarah had no intent to kill. The prosecutor mentioned that she wanted him to die. Farthest from the truth, she loved the man. She hated the abuse. She couldn't leave him. She tried. She tried kicking him out six or seven times. He kept coming back. She changed the locks. He kept coming back. She didn't have the family. She didn't have the support. She was weak. Vulnerable. You're going to hear it all. You've got to take that all into account to try to understand what happened and the circumstances surrounding this tumultuous relationship. Now, you're going to find that Sarah's not perfect. And, you know, she goes, as many of us do when we drink too much, you know, you sleep in. She slept in. 11, 12, 1, somewhere around there, she moseys downstairs looking for George. Thought he was on the computer looking for a job. She looked outside. Maybe he's out smoking a cigarette. And she sees the suitcase. She unzips it. She gets him out. He's purple. She tries her best to do some CPR. She freaks out. She, she, the, only, the only family she's got is her ex-husband, really. She relies on him. As the prosecutor said, a lot of times she'll flee to her ex-husband's house. And where her son is at? Lucas. It's the only thing she knows to do. She's kind of a, she was kind of a sheltered daughter when she was younger. She's smart, but she's, she's not worldly. She calls Brian. What do I do? He said, I'm coming up. Please, please come up. He's, he's about five minutes away. 
And she calls him again within a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the way. He gets there. He walks in the foyer and sees his legs. And she called 911. She calls 911 within a minute to me. Uh, Detective Rodriguez arrives. You know, they've got the body cam now. So it's, it's recording. So you're going to hear Sarah talking. But Sarah's freaking out. Sarah's thinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm somehow responsible. Eventually, she gives a statement to law enforcement. She gives one to Detective or Debbie Rodriguez. Of course, she's not the homicide investigator. She's just responding. She's the first responder. And you know, they know what to do. They try to assess the situation. They start putting the tape out. And then they call for the homicide investigators to come, which takes a little time. Um, so she gets a statement from Sarah. Eventually, the homicide detectives get a statement from Sarah and the one of the unmarked squad cars, and it's recorded, you may hear that. And then the next day, they, they take Sarah's phone, Sarah gives them the phone, signs the consent to take the phone, and take it to, well, uh, they have a phone, phone extraction people at the church park, where they can take it and take out all the data, all your phone calls, text messages, photographs, videos, all that. And they find these two videos. Sarah's not aware. She doesn't remember making the video. You can imagine. She gives them the phone. Of course, she makes no attempts to do anything other than, here's the phone. So they tell her, you, you, you're going to get your phone back tomorrow. We'll bring it back to you tomorrow. Well, they end up having a conversation with the female detective, homicide detective. Copsel, Chelsea Copsel. And they end up, Deputy Copsel was pregnant, or Detective Copsel was pregnant. So they end up, hey, um, we're not going to bring your phone. I'm not feeling good, pregnant. Can you, can you come to the sheriff's department? Which Sarah Boone was to tell you that that was what I was going. That's what they told me I was going to the sheriff's department for. Well, instead, it was an interrogation. And they were going to arrest her. They made their mind up on it. And they were going to confront her and try to get her to confess based on the two videos. And so there's approximately a two hour interrogation that was on the 25th in the afternoon when she got there to get her phone. They said, Well, we've got to come up here. We need to talk to you. And they got her in the room. It's a small room, but it's being videotaped and audio taped. And it goes on for about two hours of them trying to get a confession to murder. And it doesn't happen. But Sarah lies. She's scared. She can tell they're trying to pin her on this, that this was some kind of intentional act. And it was not. So she lies. She's not a lawyer. She doesn't know about self-defense. She doesn't understand she has a lawful right to defend herself. She doesn't understand that she's justified in using the force that she used. She doesn't... I wasn't there to advise her. No lawyer was there. So she lied. And you're going to hear that. So you're going to have to balance that versus her taking the stand and testifying before you. And we simply ask that you look for the evidence of cooperation of her testimony. It's going to be later, probably next week. The judges will tell you and read an instruction on evaluating a witness's credibility. And they'll talk about cooperative evidence. Other evidence that's consistent with the testimony that Sarah Brown did. So you're going to have to weigh that in her testimony.
Now, self-defense, you know, we talked about it in jury selection, usually a gun, some deadly weapon. The suitcase in this case was a physical restraint or a blocking of an attack, but it was unconventional. Self-defense, nonetheless. Now, as I said, the struggles that occurred, many of them involved the police. So you're going to actually hear from some of the police officers. They use some body cam footage. You're going to see some photographs that they took of the injuries to single thing. And some of the videos you may see of her in a very happy, joyful type of thing. Well, number one, she's intoxicated. Number two, she's safe. We so good. So her attitude is not a one of distress. You know, we're here, we're here today, it's full packed courtroom. Judge Grant's here, but but you're the most important people because you've got to decide this case honestly, fairly, and according to the law. And we talked about the two biggest principles from the Constitution that apply in this case. And in every case in which a citizen like Sarah Boone is brought into a courtroom and accused of a crime, the first is you as a juror must presume or believe that Sarah is innocent. And that belief stays with you throughout the entire trial. Because of that, she doesn't have to prove anything. That's why the state went first. In jury selection, that's why the state went first today. That's why the state will go first putting on their case. They have the burden of proof, and it's the highest burden we recognize in any type of litigation in this country. Proof beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. You are going to have doubts about this case. But the most important thing is not to rush to judgment, to keep an open mind, and understand there's two sides to this case. There's their side, and there's our side. So you can't form any fixed opinions early on. That's hard to do, as Mr. Henderson said in opening or in jury selection. That's extremely hard to do. Now you're going to hear some testimony has been mentioned in that experience. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Victims of repeat violence may fear death in a situation others would not. After hearing both sides of this case, we're confident you're going to have a reasonable doubt. And we're going to ask you to follow the law and do justice in this case. And find Sarah Boone not guilty because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can the parties approach for a moment? State, you may call your first witness. State, we call Juan Torres.
Sir, good morning. You could be seated. And once seated, if you'd state and spell your name for the record for us, please. Uh, Juan Torres, J U A N T O R R E S. Thank you, sir. You may inquire, Mr. Cacciatore. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, can you tell us how it is that you know George Torres? He's my older brother. And uh, how many siblings do you have? Six. Six or seven. And how long has your family resided here in the Central Florida area? Uh, 20 plus years. And uh, before residing in the Central Florida area, uh, were you guys in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Yes, sir. In Massachusetts. Um, your brother, um, how often, uh, your brother uh, George, that is, uh, how often would you talk with him? Uh, often we would talk, uh, let's say, on a weekly basis. And how far away did you live from George? Uh, about five, ten minutes, very close. Would you see him pretty often? I would try not to go there too much. Who did, uh, who was George living with at the time that he passed away? Wait, Sarah. And without getting into many details, what was your relationship like with Sarah? No, we didn't really have a relationship. Would it be fair to say you didn't get along with her? Yes. Back on February uh, 23rd, uh, 2020, um, did you have an occasion uh, to talk to your brother on that day? Yes, sir. And when you spoke with your brother on that day, um, did you FaceTime with him or did you speak with him over the phone? We talked on the phone. Uh, was that phone to your ear or was that phone? It was um, on speaker. And who was present? My wife and my two kids. And without telling us anything that uh, George may have said to you, um, can you tell us uh, what that conversation, what the topic of that conversation was? Just. We were just talking, like we normally did. Just he just calling me to check on me, or basically. Now, in the background of that conversation on the evening of February twenty third, twenty twenty, what did you hear? Um, Sarah's in the background, uh, yelling. And you recognized her voice. Yes. What was she yelling about? Something about choking or how he choked her. I really don't. That pretty much that was it. About how long was this conversation that you had? Uh, maybe 10 minutes, I think it was. How did the conversation end? Because she was yelling in the background, so we just. That was it. We just oh. Did she sound upset? She sounded upset. Did you talk to your brother after that conversation? No, that was the last conversation I had. Have you ever spoken to Sarah since that conversation? No. No further questions. Any cross examination?
Good morning, sir. Good morning. In the beginning when you started, it was hard for me to hear, but I know you were talking about other siblings, other family members that you had here. Um, could you repeat that for me, please? Here in, in Orlando, I have one sister and three brothers. Sister and three brothers? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, did your brother, George Torres, did he ever stay with you at any time? No. Would he ever live with you or any of, I mean, not you, but any of your other siblings? No. All right, sir. Let's go back to this phone call that you were talking about that was on February 23rd of 2020. And that phone call was approximately 7.30. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, who, who called who? He called me. And then y'all were talking. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, when he called you, uh, did you notice anything about his speech or his voice? No, he was fine. Sounded normal? Yes, sir. Okay. So he wasn't slurring his words or anything like that? No. Uh, by the way he talked or what he talked to you about, could you tell at that time if he had been consuming alcohol? No, because I knew when he was when he would drink. Okay. So, in your opinion at that time, based on what you heard and what he was talking about, you do not believe he had been drinking alcohol? No. Now, you said you heard Sarah. Yes, sir. Is that correct? How did you know it was Sarah? I can tell him her voice. You recognized her voice. So you could hear her, is that correct? Yes. All right. Uh, and you've heard Sarah speak before this, before that time, is that correct? Yes. And you've heard her speak on the phone before that time, is that correct? Yes. And you said that Sarah was yelling, is that correct, sir? Yes. And she was yelling about, he's choking me, or tell him about choking me. Yes. Okay. During that conversation, and you heard her say that, did you ask your brother, what is she talking about? No, I did not. Did that statement at that time, did that statement surprise you? Not really. You've heard it before? No. Based on Sarah's voice that you've heard, uh, was it any indication to you that she had been drinking? No. No? Sir, uh, at some point your brother said he had to go, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, did he hang up on the conversation? Yes. And did he say bye and you say bye? Yes. Thank you, sir. I don't have it. If I can confirm. You may, sir. Sir, other than um, siblings, do your 
Your mother and father, do they live in this area? Yes. Uh, were there times that George would stay with them? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. No further questions. Any redirect examination? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Defense? Actually, we'll keep them subject to recall, Your Honor. Okay. I would agree with that. All right, sir. You're released subject to recall by other party. Thank you. State would call Devin Jamro. and please state and spell your name for the record. My name is Devin Jamro. That's D-E-V-I-N-J-A-M-R-O. Thank you. You may inquire, sir. Sir, who do you work for? I work for Public Supermarkets. And what is your position with Public Supermarkets? I am the assistant store manager. And at what location? Uh, currently the Castleberry location. Uh, were you at the location on... Goldenrod and University Boulevard back in February of 2020? Yes, I was. Your Honor, may I approach the witness which has been previously marked for identification as States D and been shown to defense? D is in Delta? D is in Delta. Yes, you may. Sir, I'm showing you it's been marked for identification as States D. Could you uh, use these scissors and open uh, and open this and look at the contents of this package uh, to yourself. Sure. those items? I do, yes. And tell us, what are these items? Uh, these are Publix receipts. Are these uh, receipts um, evidence of transactions at Publix? Are they made at or near uh, the time of each transaction? They are absolutely made at the time of the transaction. And is it in the normal course of business that Publix keeps these receipts? Yes. And these fairly inaccurately uh, uh, appear to be the receipts uh, from uh, your public store. Yep. Yeah. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as States D into evidence. Any objections? No objection. What was pre marked as States D will be received into evidence without objection as States 1. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been previously marked for identification as states J and shown to defense? You may. Sir, 
So what I'm showing you is we mark for identification the states J. And you take a look at that disk. Yes. Do you see your initials on that disk? I do. Did you have an opportunity to look at that disk uh, prior to coming to court this morning? I did, yes. And tell us, what is that disk? Uh, this is CCT foot CCTV footage uh, burned from the camera system at the location. And at uh, Publix, is it uh, the regular practice of Publix to utilize surveillance cameras? Yes. And in the normal course of business, are the uh, videos from those surveillance cameras kept? Yes. And are these the cameras taken from... February 23rd, 2020, and I believe there's two video clips included, one at 12.17 uh, p.m. and another at approximately 5.39 p.m.? Yes. And they fairly and accurately represent the surveillance video uh, that was submitted from Publix to law enforcement in this case? They do, yes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification, the state's J, into evidence. Any objections? No objection. What was pre-marked as states J will be received into evidence without objection as states 2. And I have no further questions for this witness. Any cross-examination? Yes. Can this witness be released? Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. You're released. Thank you. Have a great day. State, you may call your next witness. State, we we'll call Joan Williams. Ma'am, good morning. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Okay. Joan, J-O-A-N, Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. Thank you, ma'am. Counselor, you may inquire. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, can you tell us what it is that you do for a living? I'm a 911 call taker at Long Chandler Sheriff's Office. And how long have you held that position? 24 years. And tell us what are your duties as a 911 call taker? Um, I answer phones for an emergency, non-emergency, medical, which I transfer to the medical side of business. And is it the regular practice of Orange County uh, to record 911 calls? All lines are recorded. And is it the regular practice of Orange County to keep records of each of those 911 calls? Yes. And those records are made at or near the time of each call, correct? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness which has been previously marked for identification the state's L and been shown to defense? You may. Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been previously marked for identification the state's L. Okay. Do you recognize this disc? Yes. My initials. Did you have an opportunity to uh, review this disc prior to coming to court this morning? Yes. And those are your initials on the disc? Yes. And does this disc, does it fairly and accurately uh, represent the 911 call that you took in this case on February 24, 2020 at 1259 hours? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as States L into evidence. Any objections? No objection. It was pre-marked as States L will be received with no objection as States 3. And Your Honor, I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? No, sir. Right. 
Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Can the parties approach momentarily? I call your next witness. State will call Vincent Battaglia. Sir, you may be seated. Thank you. After you're seated, if you can state and spell your name for the record for us. Vincent Battaglia, V-I-N-C-E-N-T-B-A-T-T-A-G-L-I-A. -T 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 Thank you. Sir, you may inquire. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, can you tell us what it is you do for a living? Um, right now I work for an auto parts company. And where do you live? Uh, New Jersey. Back on February of 2020, where were you living at that time? I was living at the Tealwood Apartments in Winter Park, Florida. And what were you doing uh, at that time uh, when you were living at Tealwood? I was enrolled in Full Sail University. I was in school. Um, when you were living at Tealwood, uh, did you have any roommates? Yeah, yeah, I had uh, one roommate, Brandon. Um, yeah, that was it. Them. That's Brandon Motes? Yes. Uh, did you have neighbors? Yeah. Uh, were you neighbors with uh, with uh, Sarah Boone and George Torres? Yes. And uh, approximately how long were you neighbors with them? About a year, a little over a year. I moved there in January 2019. And during the course of that year that you were neighbors with them, uh, did you have occasion to interact with them at times? Yeah. Um, in fact, did you uh, ever go over to their home? Yeah, like a couple times, yeah. And uh, I believe you tuned a guitar for uh, a child there at the house? Yeah. Um, this Tealwood uh, apartment complex, um, how would you describe uh, the walls that separated your units? Thin, like very thin walls. And with those walls being so thin, uh, would you ever have occasion to hear uh, arguing and yelling coming from Sarah, Sarah Boone and George Torres's apartment? Yeah. yeah. How often would you hear this? Almost daily. Did, did Sarah Boone ever approach you about the things that you heard coming from their apartment? Yes. And where were you when she approached you? I was smoking a cigarette on my back patio. And approximately what time? It was, was this? pretty late. I can't remember the exact time, but it was definitely anywhere between like midnight to 2 a.m., like right around there. And do you remember how, uh, how much before uh, the date when the police called that this occurred? Uh, a few months, like it, probably four to five months before that. So four or five months before February of 2020. 2020. Yeah. And when she approached you on this late evening slash early morning on that day, what did she tell you? Pretty much just kind of like, if if I do hear anything, like through the walls or whatever, as out back, just kind of keep my mouth shut, like don't really speak about it or anything like that or say anything to anyone. And I just was like, okay. Did she make any motions with her hands? Yeah, like just kind of like, you know, finger over the lips, like kind of shh, like keep it hush, like that kind of thing. So she told you 
not to record anything you may have heard about arguments or yelling or fighting, anything going on over there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you recall the evening of February 23rd, 2020? I, I do, yeah. And what about that evening sticks out to you? The that sticks out to me from that night was literally just the loud, there was a very, very loud noise that I heard that was loud and powerful enough to shake my bedroom wall. And I remember that because I was sitting on my bed on FaceTime with my girlfriend at the time, and I literally felt the wall shake and it stopped me mid conversation. And she even asked me through the computer, like, what was that? And I was like, I have no idea. Did you hear any yelling? <clears throat> coming from their apartment on that night. Before that, yeah, like it was just a arguing kind of stuff. What was the last thing you heard? The last thing I heard was like the, the loud noise and just a little bit of shuffling and that was kind of it. It just kind of went silent after that. Did you hear, hear anything that was being said not not clearly, and it, uh, it was never really anything clear. It was just like you could hear arguing back and forth, just kind of like um, and kind of like an "I hate you, I hate you," like it's whatever it is, whatever the argument was about, kind of thing. At the time, that's really all it was, but it was never really clear enough to hear like the full argument. And honestly, I never really paid attention to too much to it. If I heard it, I kind of stepped into my living room to be further away from it. Did you hear both the defendant's voice and also George Torres's voice? Yeah, yeah. All the time, you, it was like a back and forth. Yeah. So other than the statements and the phrases of I hate you, I hate you, you weren't able to discern the, the, the contents of this argument? No, no. What was the last sound you heard? The last sound that I heard was like the, the loud banging noise that um, it was like a very odd sounding noise that I've never heard before this day, but it very much sounded like it was the, like where my bed was positioned. It was kind of towards the back of the apartment and it almost sounded like it was coming towards me, but like on the side of me, you know, then it was just like a loud rumbling noise. like that literally sounded like it was kind of far away from me and then it like ended up like almost next to me. And like I said, the walls are thin, so like it's very easy to hear like through the walls and not even just sideways, like I hear my upstairs neighbor, like all around very thin walls. Now, was your bedroom, uh, where was it located in your apartment? The back of the apartment. So it was like, there's like a little kick out next to my patio and that's like, my, that was my bedroom back there, like uh, along the grass back there. On the first floor? On the first floor, yeah. yeah. I have no further questions. Okay. Any cross-examination? <clears throat> Mr. Cagney, good morning. Good morning. Now, you said that you lived there next to Sarah Boone and uh, George Torres for about a year? Yes, sir. Are you aware that uh, the police were called to their residence? Like... While you were while you were there for the year, are you aware of any any incident in which the police were called to their residence? I had never seen anybody there, but I had had other neighbors in the complex tell me that it has been on multiple occasions. So that's just, why I, just just instead of what somebody else told you. Yeah, yeah. Just what you would observe. Did you ever the year that you were there living <clears throat> next to them? Yeah. Did you ever were you ever aware that the police were called to their residence? No, the, the times that I was home, I never, I never saw any police at the at the apartment there. Right. And you, did you work odd hours or? You went to yeah, school? and with my schooling and stuff too, I used to have class at like one o'clock in the morning, so I, all the time I was at random moments, like just not home throughout the day and night and stuff like that. So yeah. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not, based on your interaction with Sarah Boone? I'm not gonna object. Let me finish the question first, please. Do you know 
from your experience with Sarah Boone and your experience with George Torres, that they drank alcohol? Yeah. Hang on. I'll withdraw to that question. Okay, thank you. Yes. Are you aware that they, they both consumed alcohol to excess? Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir, of course. Well, Vincent, I think you would testify, you, you may have given a statement to law enforcement. Yes, it was one of the detectives. A recorded statement? Yes, I can't remember his name, but yes. Okay, and I think it was on February 23rd of 2020? Yeah, right around that time, yeah. I believe you had said that... Um, I'm going to object this to uh, improper impeachment. Approach. Objections overruled for now. Sir, would it be fair to say on that date you got home around 7? 7, 7 uh, p.m. 7 p.m.? Yes. Uh, which day was this? Sunday, February 23rd, 2020. Uh, no, that day I actually got home from work probably around I th 1 or 2 o'clock or so. In the morning? No, in the afternoon. Because I, I went to work that morning at around 5 a.m. And you said that uh, you heard the normal yelling and arguing at about that time when you got home? Um, no, it was, it, well, yeah, it was around that time, but it was really around like 10 o'clock, 1030 is when like the arguing I could right here clearly. It was like around 1030 at night. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you redirect? Just very briefly. Yes, sir. So on uh, cross-examination, you were asked uh, about uh, the, the arguing you heard, and you, I believe your testimony was that it was pretty in, uh, intense around 1030. Yeah. Uh, approximately what time was it that you heard this loud crashing thump sound that you described um Just little that, after that an overruled um it was a little after that arguing and stuff it was probably around 11 11 15 probably 30 45 minutes after like the arguing i could hear started no other questions can this witness be released yes sir. Yeah. not subject to recall we would like him subject to recall you've got his number okay your honor may we approach yes all right, sir, you are released, not subject to recall. Have a great day. Thank you. The state would call Brandon Motes. Bless you. Thank you, sir. You can be seated. State, and spell your name for the record for us. Uh, yeah, my name is Brandon Motes, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-M-O-A-T-S. Thank you. Mr. Cacciatore, you may inquire. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Matt. Good afternoon. Uh, can you tell us um, how it is that you uh, knew Sarah Boone? Uh, I moved into the apartment next door to her when I was in college. And so... 
When was that that you were in college? Uh, I would have gone, moved down here in 2019 and would have been there until like 2021, 2022. Mm. So she was your neighbor at Tealwood Apartments, is that correct? Uh, yeah, it would have been Tealwood back then, yeah. And uh, did you have any roommates back then? Uh, yes, I, I was rooming with uh, Vincent Battaglia. And uh, during that time, uh, what were you doing? Uh, yeah, like, as far as work and school? And oh, uh, I was just going to school. You, uh, during the time of this, yeah, I would have just been going to school. I don't think I would have had my job yet. I was, I was just a student. Uh, did you have much interaction uh, with the defendant or with George Torres in this case? Honestly, I avoided them as much as possible, usually. Um, the apartment where you lived, um, tell us, how would you describe the walls that separated uh, so, the units? Yeah, uh, I remember that my bedroom was like the front facing bedroom and our walls shared a wall with where their staircase was. So like the way the apartments were laid out, we had a one story apartment, they had a two story apartment. So they had a staircase running right next to the walls next to uh, like our bedrooms. Would you ever have occasion to hear uh, arguing and yelling uh, going on inside of the defendant's apartment? Yes, they, they, the, the walls were pretty thin. So if people were yelling, you could definitely hear it. And how often would you hear arguments or disagreements going on over there? When I first moved in, it was so like it was at least like once a week to the point that I started tuning them out. Like I, I got good enough at just like not listening to them. They argued very, very often. Did you do you recall the evening of February 23rd, 2020? Yes, sir. And on that evening, could you hear arguing going on? in their unit? Uh, not late into the evening, uh, earlier into the evening, probably like seven, eight o'clock that, uh, that evening, probably like early, yeah, earlier on, I could hear arguing. And where were you inside of your apartment? Uh, I would have been in my bedroom pretty much all night. And your bedroom, just so that uh, we can paint the picture, Oh, where would that uh, would that have been on the first floor or the second floor? We had a we had a first floor apartment. Okay, so all the units were or all the bedrooms were on the, the first floor. Yeah, like I was saying before, uh, we had a one story apartment, and then they next door had like a two story townhouse. So we only had the one floor. Understood. And at a certain point in the evening. Did you hear a loud crashing sound? Yeah, probably around 10, 30, 11 o'clock that evening. And what, can you describe that sound for us in more detail? Uh, I mean, yeah, at literally, like I said, at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock, it's uh, the way their staircase was set up, I could, uh, my bedroom, the top of their staircase would have been like above my ceiling and then it ends next to where like my roommate's apartment was. So I could hear something start above me super loud and then fall away from me at, like, at, like it was falling down the stairs. Did this... Um did this affect the walls that were between your two apartments? Oh yeah, me and my roommate, literally, I remember me and my roommate talking the next day about like, we could literally like it shook both of our rooms. Did you ever have occasion to talk with the defendant about what happened? I never saw her after that. She would have, yeah, she, uh, I never saw her after that happened. No further questions. Any cross-examination?
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, you were asked by the state if uh, you had, had ever had any interactions with uh, Sarah Boone or George Torres. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I think you said you tried to avoid them. Y yeah. Uh, I don't like drunk people, and they were drunk a lot, so I did not interact with them. Okay. Do you, do you remember this interaction with Sarah Boone? in 2009 when you woke up and witnessed Sarah Sue. I would have been nine years old in 2009. I'm sorry, 2019, good catch. In 2019 when you woke up and witnessed Sarah sleeping on the concrete patio. Oh, this, uh, this may have been a slight misconception in how I said this. I never uh, saw, uh, woke up and saw her sitting on the patio myself. That, uh, I would have seen her on the patio eventually, but it's not like I woke up and went back and saw her on the patio. Uh, this was my roommate relaying the story that she had fallen uh, fallen asleep on the back patio, and then I like saw her. Okay, so you did not witness that yourself, or did you see her? I saw her asleep on the back patio. I was just uh, clearing up the sequence of events there. Okay, thank you. Uh, another time. Uh, do you recall our interaction with Miss Boone when you were coming home from school and uh, she was trying to talk to you and she seemed paranoid and rambling? And yeah, I had I had gotten locked out of my apartment, so I was waiting on the uh, steps to, I was like waiting on the steps outside of my apartment for my roommate to get home. So she came up and started talking to me. Uh, I don't really remember too many like details of what she was saying because I didn't want to talk to her. She just, but yeah. Okay. Do you remember saying that you believe Sarah was avoiding going into her apartment? That's definitely the vibe. I don't remember what she was saying, but like the vibe she was giving off was that she didn't want to go home. Now I believe, and I just want to make sure that I heard you. You said that the first arguments, other than the boom, which was like 10 something, uh, initially it was around 7, 7 p.m. You heard arguing? It would have, yeah, because it would have been. I rem I remember that day I got home from class around five because uh, I get, get got out of class around four thirty usually and walked home so I would have gotten home around five five thirty and it would have been after I took because I came home I made myself lunch and I took a shower and then I heard all of their arguing so it would have been about an hour and a half two hours after I got home so around seven to eight o'clock. And during that time, when you say arguing, was it back and forth? Uh, I honestly, I wouldn't really be able to say if it was back and forth. I, I don't know too, like, I wouldn't remember too, too vividly if it was back and forth. Well, let me ask you this. Did yeah. you hear a male voice? I, yes, I heard a male voice. Did you hear a female voice? Yes. Okay. Were they both loud? Yes. If I can confirm, Jeff. Yes, sir, of course. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Subject to recall, Jeff. All right. All right, sir, you release subject to recall. Thank you. Can the parties approach? Members of our jury, thank you so much for your time, your attention, and your participation in this very important process. It is 1221. At this point in time, we're going to go ahead and take our lunch break. I'm going to ask that you return here. Uh, no later than 2 p.m. so we can pick up at that point in time outside of here 12 Alpha in the Orange County Courthouse.
And I'm gonna give you an instruction. You're gonna hear this instruction a lot over the next couple of days. Um, jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors, do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have any discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, please leave your pens and your notepads on each chair. The deputy will collect them. We'll see you at two o'clock, and I thank you for your service. State, anything we need to address? Top of the state. Defense. Yes, sir. All right, Ms. Boone, I just got a couple of inquiries of you, ma'am, before we release. Are you satisfied with your attorney so far throughout this trial? Definitely. And are you on board with the strategy that they've employed so far in this trial? All right, thank you very much. We'll be in recess till 2 o'clock. Court's off the record. All right, we're back on the record, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone, 2020 CF 2603. Can I get appearances for counsel for the record, starting with counsel for the state? Dave Kester on behalf of the state. William J. for the state. And defense. And James Elders for Sarah Boone. Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. Kevin Beck on behalf of Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone is seated at counsel's table wearing the same black suit and pink blouse from this morning. Um, state, anything we need to address before we bring back in our panel? Can we get the evidence projection system up and can we test it before we yes. go live? Yes, sir. <clears throat> if you want to test it out, Mr. J. Uh, anything else, State, we need to address? Not this time, Your Honor. Defense? No, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, just in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, there are some uh, persons to, behind me to my right and my left. I run the mock trial program at Barry University School of Law here in town, and these are some of my students as a member of that program, so they're here just simply to observe. So pay no mind or attention to them. Uh, with that, are we ready to bring in our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. All right, let's stand and bring in our panel. State, do you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. All right, y'all can be seated. Thank you. Members of the jury, good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. If you could, again, by a show of hands, com confirm that you complied with the court's instructions that we gave prior to the break. 
record reflect all jurors' hands have been raised. With that, the state is going to continue with their evidence presentation this afternoon. State, you may call your next witness. State will call Brian Boone. Good afternoon. You could be seated. After seated, if you could please state and spell your name for the record for us. Uh, Brian Boone, B R I A N B O O N E. Thank you, sir. You may inquire. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, can you tell us how it is that you know the defendant? Um, I dated her for quite a while, and then we eventually got married. When you say you dated her for quite a while. Um, how long are we talking? Um, I met her in the late 90s, and I believe it was around 2005 when we got married. Did you have any children as a result of your marriage with the defendant? Yes, we had one son. And uh, how old is that son? Um, he is currently getting ready to turn 14. Um, did your marriage with the defendant <clears throat> And no, it did not. And approximately when was it that you uh, separated and began proceedings for a divorce? Um, probably 2017, I'm thinking maybe. And at that time, um, when was your divorce actually finalized? Um, oh, maybe it was 2016. I think the divorce was 2017, I believe. <laughs> and after your divorce, uh, what was your custody arrangement uh, with your son that you had in common with the defendant? Um, she was supposed to have him on Mondays and Tuesdays. I would have him Wednesday, Thursdays, and then we'd alternate Friday through Sundays every other week. So one week you would have five days with your son, and another week she would have five days with him? Correct. And was this still the same custody arrangement in February of 2020? Yes. And in February of 2020, um, did you have, uh, do you recall the events that occurred, I guess, first on the, the late evening of February 23rd, 2020? Um, on that evening? Yes. Uh, uh, well, apparently, uh, Sarah called me at one point during the night. Do you recall about what time she called you? I think it was 11 something. When you answered the phone, how did Sarah sound on the phone? She sounded like she had been drinking, was pretty drunk. Were you able to understand what the defendant was saying? Um, somewhat, but she woke me up. I had work the next day. I was asleep when she called. Um, She's done this before, calling me late at night, and generally I kind of just try to ignore it, so I wasn't really paying attention. Um, who was she living with at the time? Uh, George Torres. When she called you late that evening, uh, could you hear George in the background at all? N not that I remember, no. Did you pay much attention to this phone call? No. Now, the following morning, on February 24th, 2020, did you begin to call the defendant? Yes, I did. And you. approximately what time did you begin to call the defendant? Um, I think it was like 11 o'clock or something. 
And why was it that you were calling her? Um, well, it was going to be Monday. Um, I had had him on Sunday and dropped him off at school, and I was calling to try and find out if she was going to be actually picking him up that day. Why would you have a question about whether or not she was picking him up? She wasn't generally very good about actually getting him on the day she was supposed to. So it was not uncommon for you to have to remind her uh, to pick him up or to make sure that she, she was going to pick him up? Well, I mean, remind or just find out if she was going to or if she was just going to give him over to me as what happened. Do you remember at what time on February 24th you actually got in touch with the defendant? Um, I think it was like 1230 or something. And when you actually got in touch with her, what did she tell you on the phone? Um, that George was dead and if I would come over. Did she say what happened to him? Um, I don't remember if she told me then on the phone or when I got there, but she told me they had been playing hide and seek and that she fell asleep. What did you advise her to do? Um, I told her she needed to call 911 and that I would come over as soon as I could. And this is on your first phone call here at approximately 1230. Yes. On 224. 20. <clears throat> yes. Did she, did she call you again while you were en route to her residence? She did. She called to find out if I was um, still going to be coming over. And when you spoke with her while you were en route, what, if anything, did you advise her? I told her she needed to call 911 and told her I was on my way, but she needed to get somebody over there. How long did it take you to arrive? at her residence from the first phone call or yes from the first one um well i mean i don't live i mean i live a minute or two drive away but i had to get my puppy we, we had just gotten a puppy recently i had to get him in his crate and stuff like that and put something on because i was working from home and um Total time, maybe 10 minutes. When you arrived at her uh, apartment, um, tell us, tell us what she told you when you arrived. Um, that, um, I mean, George was dead and I, once again, I don't remember if she told me now or before that, um, they had been playing hide and seek and she fell asleep, but. I, at that time, told her again she needed to get 911 called to get somebody over there. Had she called 911 at this point? No, she had not. So you've advised her now three times to call 911? Yes. Did you go inside of her apartment? I walked in the front door into the little tiled area, like entrance way thing. What, if anything, did you observe when you made it to that point? Um, looking into the living room, I could see like the end of his feet and maybe a little bit of some legs that were kind of coming out around uh, the back side of the kitchen area. Did you continue to go into the apartment? No. Where did you go? Um, Sarah told me she was going to call 911 and go outside and have a cigarette and a drink and ask me to come out there with her. And I told her that I didn't really feel comfortable being inside. And I went out front and got in my car and waited for people to show up. Did you witness the defendant call 911? Um, I think I was in there when she dialed it and first got somebody on the phone but I wasn't there for the whole conversation now. I was outside. Did you stay there at the scene while police arrived? Yes, I, I was there, I was part of it. I knew I'd have to talk to somebody, so. Did you talk with law enforcement? I did. 
Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross-examination? <laughs> we want to reserve our questions for when we call in in our case. Okay. All right, sir, you're subject to recall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just as long as he remains under subpoena. My understanding is subject to recall. So, so somebody will contact me about that? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. State, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, may we approach a moment? Yes. Members of the jury, we'd appreciate your patience for a few moments while uh, the state um, attaches a Bluetooth speaker so that they may publish some evidence that's been received so far. Mr. J, whenever you're ready, sir. Permission to publish three? You may do so. Okay, man, that's fine. We're still looking for compression to him, okay? All right? 
If you look at your hand, all this first of all, right in the center of the chest, right between the nipples. Yes. Would you have had some of that hand? Benny, I'm telling you. Six, eight, 
Yes, sir. You may call your next witness. Say you we'll call Abraham Moreno. Sir, good afternoon. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Abraham, A-B-R-A-H-A-M, last name is Moreno, M-O-R-E-N-O. Thank you, sir. You may be seated. Mr. Castro, you may inquire. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Tell us, what what do you do for a living? I was, I'm a maintenance supervisor for apartment complexes. Um, is that what your position was back on, in February of 2020? Yes, it was. And what apartment complex? Tealwood Park Apartments. And um, how long did you work for Tealwood Park Apartments? About two years. And tell us, what were some of your duties um, in your position there with Tealwood Park? Um, daily, I cleaned the grounds, walked the property, answered maintenance calls, did emergencies, dealt with vendors. Uh, did you become familiar with the residents there at the apartment complex? Yes. Did you have occasion to uh, meet the defendant in this case and also a George Torres? Yes. Let me turn your attention to February 24th of 2020. Do you recall that date? Yes. And on that date, did you have occasion to come in contact with the defendant in this case? Yes, I did. And tell us, what was the circumstances in which you came into contact with her on February 24th, 2020? I was called by the manager and the assistant manager to come to, the, to come to her unit. I believe she was already sitting outside at that time. And when she was sitting outside of her unit, what, if anything, did you observe uh, about her and about the unit? The police was there, her ex-husband was present, she was sitting outside, and, and that's when she decided she wanted to talk to me and the managers. And what did she tell you? She's confused, she's not exactly sure what happened. Um, she pointed out that she recalls that they were playing a game of hide and seek. There was an instance where she was gonna teach him a lesson, and then she just, doesn't recall anything up until the next morning. Did she say she fell asleep? Yes, she did. Did she say things got out of hand? I don't really recall that part, but I do recall her stating that they were playing their game and that George um, went into a suitcase and I didn't, I didn't ask any questions. I just let her talk for herself. How long was this conversation? For about... Four or five minutes. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Any cross-examination? Yes, sir. You may inquire, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This conversation that um, you had with Miss Boone, yes, that took place on the twenty fourth. Is that correct? Yes. And who else was present on the time that the conversation was taking place? Standing right next to me would have been Melissa Sexton and Eugene Harris, as well as the officer who was in front of the door. Okay. So there was a law enforcement officer there that day. Is that correct? Yes. Right. 
Now, on the 24th is when you said that Ms. Boone made this statement to you. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, they were playing hide and seek? Yes. And what else did she say happened? She, she had told me that they were playing hide and seek. They had drank. Um, she was trying to teach him a lesson, and that was that. She went upstairs. She went to sleep. She woke up. She doesn't know what happened. Okay. So that was on the 24th. Yes. All right. On the 26th, uh, were, were you not interviewed by law enforcement? Yes. Okay. So I, may have had my, I may have my days wrong, but it all happened on the same day. All right, the 24th, do you remember two days later that a Detective Scott Lowen conducted an interview with you at 4704 Lucera Court, Winter Park, Florida? Do you remember that interview? Yes. So that was two days later, is that correct? I would assume so. Yes. All right, so when he interviewed you two days later, did you tell him about this statement that Ms. Boone made to you that you just told this jury in court? I did mention it to him. You did mention it to him? Okay. I mentioned to them that we did have a conversation. Did you tell him the content of the conversation? I may not have told him the whole content, but I did tell him we had a conversation. All right, well, what did you tell him? What content did you tell him on that, the 26th? That they were playing hide and seek, that she was confused, she doesn't know what happened, I do believe I did mention to him the fact that she had said that she was trying to teach him a lesson. Not that anything was done with malice. I didn't say that at all. Okay. So it's your recollection now today that on the 26th, you told Officer Lowen what you just told this jury. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Uh, sir. In preparing for this case, did you have a meeting with the Assistant State Attorney on September 23rd of 2024? Did I have a meeting? Yes. A brief chit-chat over the phone. A brief chit-chat that was over the phone? Yes, sir. All right. At that point in time over the phone, did you tell him Did you tell him that Sarah Boone, the defendant, stated that she was teaching him a lesson and, and things got out of hand and that she fell asleep? Yes. Is that what you told him? Yes. Okay. And that was in 2024 of September the 23rd of this year, 2024. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Are you telling us that back on... February the 26th of 2020, you told Officer Lowen at that time the same thing? If I recall, yes. So did she ever tell you how things got out of hand? No. Sir, uh, you testified that you knew both um, Mr. Torres and Ms. Boone, is that correct? Yes. Uh, you actually knew George Torres um, from a different time, didn't you? Yes, I did. When did you first know George Torres? In the 1990s. In the 1990s? He was a teenager and he lived down the street from me and my wife. So you had had a previous relationship with Mr. Torres? No, not at all. Not at all? You just knew him from then? Yes, as I stated, he was a teenager and I was an adult. Okay. During this time, though, that you became reacquainted with him, uh, did y'all uh, establish a friendship at that time here in Orlando? I wouldn't say a friendship, but an acquaintance, yes. Okay.
Sir, on Monday, February the 24th, that would have been the day that you were with uh, Ms. Sexton and Gene Harris. Yes. Out in front of the apartment. Correct. Did you talk to law enforcement that day? No. You did not talk to him that day? I don't recall talking to him that day, no. Okay. Thank you, sir. I don't have any. Uh, if I can confer. You can, sir. Thank you, sir. I don't have any further questions. Any redirect examination? Just brief. All right. Thank you. Back in the 90s, um, when you had previously uh, known uh, George Torres, in this case, where were you living at that time? I lived across the street. I lived on one block. He lived the next block over down in the middle. In what city? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, when did you move from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? 2018, I believe. So in the intervening years um, from your move from Philadelphia uh, to coming to work at Tealwood Park, did you have any contact with, uh, with, with George Torres? No, as a matter of fact, I moved from that particular block in 2005, so I don't meet Judge again until I work at Teal Woods. Which, when did you start working at Teal Woods? 2018, 2019, roughly there. So no further questions. Can this witness be released? No, you're on this subject to recall. All right, sir, you'll be released subject to recall. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. State, call your next witness. State will call Deputy Kayla Rodriguez. Good afternoon, ma'am. You could be seated. Please state your name and spell it for the record if you could for us. Kayla Rodriguez. Kayla, K-A-Y-L-A. -A, Rodriguez, R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z. Right, thank you. Mr. Gatchatori, you may inquire. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi. Can you tell us who is <clears throat> did you work for? Orange County Sheriff's Office. And what is your position with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Deputy Sheriff. And how long have you been a Deputy Sheriff? A little over eight years since 2016. And tell us, what are your duties as a deputy sheriff? As a deputy, I respond to calls for service, anything from a over with call, like a car being keyed the day prior, or a 911 emergency. And what type of training do you need to be a deputy sheriff? So for me, I obtained my bachelor's degree from UCF in criminal justice in 2014. After that, in 2016, I was hired by the sheriff's office. Um, right after um, being hired, I went straight into the academy. The academy is five months of training. We go over everything from case law, um, scenarios, defensive tactics, uh, physical training. After that, I do two more months with the sheriff's office where we go specifically into policy related to Orange County specifically. After that, I do three months on the road with a trainer where we are evaluated periodically through that process. You have a partner, you respond to calls for service during that time, and you slowly learn how to handle calls by yourself. Do you also uh, undergo continuing training as a condition of your employment? Yes. Tell us, what were, were you working on February 24th, 2020? Yes. And um, tell us, what area of the county were you working in? Orange County, unincorporated Orange County. And uh, did you receive a call in regards to this case? Yes. And what was that call? Um, what information did you have at the time you received the call? So the dispatcher informed me that a woman called 911. She was actively performing CPR and that her boyfriend was in a suitcase. And did you respond out to the scene? Yes. And when you responded out to the scene, were you dressed 
uh, similarly as you are dressed today. Yes. And uh, just for the record, you have, uh, it looks like a standard uh, green uniform on with a, a tool belt, uh, your, your firearm, and also uh, radio, body-worn camera, badge. Yes. Tell us about your body-worn camera. So my body camera is used to capture scenes when we arrive. So as we are conducting any sort of law enforcement action, we turn our camera on. When you turn your camera on, um, tell us, is there immediate, does it immediately capture uh, sound uh, at that point? It does not. When we activate our camera, it goes back a minute. And the minute that it goes back to, you don't hear any audio for that first minute. Um, tell us also uh, about the uh, capacity and the battery life of your camera as well. So the battery will last us an entire shift, typically, if it's in a buffering mode. So if we're not recording, it will last the entire shift. As we record, it does drain the battery. So typically, we will turn it off if we're sitting in our car for an extended period of time, if we call our supervisor, if we're talking to another deputy on the side, away from a scene, we will not have the camera recording. If it recorded throughout the entire shift, the battery would die. We would need multiple batteries. So you actually activate uh, the camera in order to begin recording? Correct. Uh, was your body camera op or operational uh, on this call out? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness, which has been previously marked for identification, it states H, I, and G that have been shown to defense? You may. Ma'am, I'm first showing you what's been marked for identification as states I. Do you recognize that disc? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to review that disc prior to coming to court today? Yes. And tell us, what is that disc? Body-worn camera from the day of the incident. From February 24, 2020? Correct. And is that your initials on the disc? Yes. And does that disc fairly and accurately represent uh, the contents of your body-worn camera? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as states I into evidence. Any objections? No objection. All right, what was pre-marked as I will be received into evidence without objection as states four. Ma'am, next I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as states H. <clears throat> take a look at that disc. Tell us, what is that disc? Body-worn camera from the day of the incident. From February 24, 2020? Yes. And did you have an opportunity to review that disc prior to coming to court today? Yes. And is that your initials on the disc? Yes. And does that disc fairly and accurately represent um, the contents of that portion of your body-worn camera from that day? Yes. You're right, this time I'd like to move what's been marked for identification as states H into evidence? No objection to any of those coming in. What was pre-marked as states H will be received without objection as states 5. And lastly, ma'am, I'm showing you some marked for identification as states G. Do you recognize this disc? Yes. And tell us, what is that disc? Body-worn camera from the day of the incident. From February 24, 2020? Yes. And you had an opportunity to review this uh, camera prior to coming to court? Yes. And is that your initials on the disc? Yes. And it fairly and accurately represents um, your conduct on the body worn camera? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's been marked for identification of states G into evidence. No objection. Thank you. What was pre-marked as states G will be received without objection as state 6. Your Honor, uh, request permission to publish states four. You may. Your Honor, uh, may we dim the light? Use the overhead projector. Yes.
I'll talk to you guys if I can make my life. Like my, um, the public manager. Tell him really quick, or we'll take care of that. Where is he at? He's walked that way. Oh, don't worry about that. We'll take care of that for you, okay? Or is 
States five. You may proceed. Yes. Okay. And like air was coming out and he was gurgling, but 
I could tell by the question. Can she, can you had a DCPI, you were doing that on your own? Yes. Okay. And then the person that was on the phone with me also, I kind of was into it. And he's got no medical, he doesn't take any medication. I don't know. Like, I don't know medical wise. Like, what, I know he doesn't take any medications whatsoever. Okay. Um, the only thing, like I said, I don't know if alcohol has to do with it, but we've had a bottle of wine. Okay. All right. Here. I want you to sit back down because I don't want to. Can I have one more sip of water? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. That first little 29 or potential audible. Watch for it here. Yeah, I think they die. I'll do what I can to get you a cup because I don't want you to have anything going on. The cups are like right there. Okay. Right here, I'll talk to the ex husband right now. Oh, I won't. Can I have a cigarette, please? Ma'am, I can't take anything out of the house. It's on the back porch. No, nope. it's all day. Secure, okay? I'll try my best to get you what you need, okay? Maybe one of these guys will have a pack from someone, but, you know, sit down and I'll try and get you what you need, okay? Just cut, please. Okay. I don't want you on your feet. I don't want you Yes, you put him on the side. He came back in? So there's no, no fence then? Um, Corporal, I can give you a line now. She's um sitting on the curb. Yeah. Um, I'm still alive. I was getting ready to call you guys. Yeah. Um, okay. Want to talk over here? Your Honor, request permission to publish State 6. You may do so. Okay. So we decided to get in the suitcase. So I thought it would be funny to, and he was talking about it too. Mm -hmm. 
to get the muffin there. Mm -hmm. I go upstairs and fell asleep. So this morning when I was up, this afternoon when I actually got up out of the bed, I got the church to get downstairs on the laptop. Really quiet. But then I came upstairs and I'm like, where is he? Like, and I, that's when I found it. Okay. Um, I don't know what happened. Okay. And then you weren't sure about if you woke up this morning? It was afternoon. I mean, I wasn't really sure but I didn't want to come downstairs. So okay. I just laid in bed for a little while. And then I eventually came downstairs. He was about where he was. And I was like, oh my God, this is a big case. So I pulled him out and I just pressed him out. And he started to try to make CPR one. I told you that. So I told Ryan. Okay. And then I, as soon as he got here, which is 30 seconds on the road, I told you that. Okay. The person on the phone had me do the concussion. Really, so I can count what happened. Okay. So that's what happened. Okay. So I told you that. Okay. Okay. So and, um, so as part of our investigation, we obviously have to go inside the house. We have to look at things. Are you okay with us going in the house and looking at things? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and forensics, so we have to have our forensics crime scene investigators come out. Are you also okay with them coming inside, taking photographs? And, okay. Okay. Can I ask, is Brian diagnosed with any kind of medical history? How can I know of?
Yeah, we're going to be I just want to be like, yeah, this is going to be a lot. I'm afraid for my life. I want you to know that. I'm afraid for my life. His family has never liked it. I'm the blue eyed white devil, is what they call me. So they've never liked me. They've never taken me in. They've never accepted me. I'll put it that way. Have you called any of them? Um, we talked to his daughter just today. No, I mean, like, about this. Is no. That okay. That's so no one's going to know until we will be making that notification. So they're going to tell me. Okay. Well, they local? Yes. They're down the road. They're going to tell me. His kids are going to tell me. So they're, going me. they're going to tell me. This was not intentional. Okay. So they're not going to understand that. They're not going to accept it. We're going to do a thorough investigation. We will, I will take, we will definitely make sure that you don't feel scared when we need to. Okay. And when my nine-year-old. Well, he's at school and he's with your husband. I know. Well, your husband said that, your ex-husband said he didn't raise this to your family and he picked up. Oh, okay, mom. Okay. All right, we're going to go inside. Yes, please. Can you guys? Yes, please. All you have to do is get their attention if you, if you have a question and you need to talk to us. He's standing right there. She'll be right here. Yeah. Okay, so you guys tell me. Like, so you're telling me, like, you, you won't call whoever it is without telling me, right? I mean, I have a We're not calling. We're not making phone calls. We're actually going to speak to them in person. Yeah. We are. Okay. It'll be later. Prior to us making I'm not going to be here. They're going to kill me. Okay. We'll address all of that, okay, before we leave. Okay? This was. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Just stay seated, okay, Sarah? I know you're panicking, okay? Just relax. I'm going to talk to you. We'll keep checking on you. While you were at the scene, did you also make contact with Brian Boone? Yes. Did you take a statement from him as well? I did. Were all your interactions with the defendant on that day captured on your body-worn camera? Yes. I have uh, no additional questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross-examination? No questions, Judge. Is this witness released? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. All right. You're released, not subject to recall, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Can the parties approach for a moment? All right. Members of our jury, it is 321 at this time. We're going to go ahead and take that afternoon regularly scheduled break. Um, I'm going to ask you to come back here in 15 minutes at 337. Similar instructions that I've given you previously, please don't conduct any independent investigation or research as the person, places, things, or charge involved, and do not have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else. I thank you for your service, and we'll see you shortly. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. Bless you. State anything else we need to address? Uh, no, Your Honor. Defense? No, Your Honor. All right. We'll be in a recess till 337. Thank you very much. 2020 CF 26. We are back on the record. Case number 2020 CF 2603. State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Let me get appearances for the state. Dave Ketchikar on behalf of the state. William J. for the state. Defense? Jackie Zolens for the state. Tony Henderson with Sarah Boone. Yeah, we're back. Oh, yeah, Sarah Boone. All right. Ms. Boone is still seated at counsel's table, wearing the same black suit and pink blouse from this morning. Uh, state, anything we need to address before we bring back in our panel? Not from the state. Defense? No, sir. All right. Let's go ahead and stand, and we can bring back in our panel. Thank you. You may be seated. State, you recognize our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense, do you recognize our jury? Yes. Members of the jury, again, if you could please raise your hands, showing that you complied with the court's instructions during our last break. All right, the record reflects all jurors have raised their hands. State, you may call your next witness. State, we'll call Deputy John Martinez.
Sir, good afternoon. Can you state and spell your name for the record for us? Thanks, sir. You may be seated. Thank you. You may inquire, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, tell us, who is it that you work for? Orange County Sheriff's Office. And what is your position with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Uh, Deputy Sheriff. How long have you been with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? I'm going on my 16 year. Prior to working for the Orange County Sheriff's Office, uh, do you have any uh, previous law enforcement experience? I do. And where was that? I first started my career with the New York City Police Department. And how long were you with the New York City Police Department? About 10 years. And what was your position with the New York City Police Department? I was a police officer. And uh, at the Sheriff's Office, um, tell us uh, what are some of your duties as a Deputy Sheriff? I uh, respond to calls of service. Um, my, now, my primary function is the uh, school resource officer. And uh, is continuing training a condition of your employment with the sheriff's office? It is. Tell us, how is it that you became involved in this case? I was uh, dispatched to this location. And what was this location? Uh, it was located at 4748 France Lane, apartment number three. And is that here in uh, Orange County, Florida? It is. And when you uh, responded to that location, uh, who did you first come into contact with? I came in contact with uh, Ms. Sarah Boone. Do you see Sarah Boone here in court today? I do. Could you please point to her and identify an article of clothing she's wearing? Uh, it's the lady sitting in the middle with the black blazer. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witnesses identified the defendant? The record will still reflect. During the time that you uh, uh, were on the scene, did you have a body-worn camera? I did. And was that body-worn camera activated? It was. Uh, were all your uh, contacts with Ms. Boone uh, recorded on that body-worn camera? It was. Uh, were other deputies also on the scene at that time? Yes. And uh, was Deputy Rodriguez there? She was. So would both of your body worn cameras uh, both captured some of the, uh, the, the same time frames? Uh, correct, yes. Did you have an occasion to go inside of the apartment? I did. And inside of the apartment, what observations did you make? Uh, when I first entered the apartment, I noticed a uh, Hispanic male laying on his back in looks like a small nook dining area. Um, later identified Mr. George Torres. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who's been previously marked for identification as states K and been shown to defense? You may. Sir, I'm showing you it's been marked for identification as states K. Do you recognize that disc? I do. And tell us, what is that disc? Is a copy of my body-worn camera. And does this body-worn camera fairly and accurately depict the uh, uh, portion of the events that took place on February 24, 2020. It does. And are those your initials on the disc? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as States K into evidence. Any objections? No objection. What was pre-marked as States K will be received into evidence without objection as State 7. Your Honor, request permission to publish. You may. Madam Clerk, can you dim the lights?
now. I'll get you some, buddy, okay? Right, she wants to say something. She wants to call someone. Okay.
I got nobody. I have a brother that's in the Marines, and then I got another one next to the jail. Unless you run in a Marine local? No. Well, he in Altamont, but I think he's doing whatever he's doing. But the only way your phone's in five, correct? Yeah. Does he have a phone? No. He doesn't. He uses my phone. He uses your phone. Yeah, we okay. share them. So the only way, the only place I could go is over to Brown's house. So I don't think I'll have a problem with it. So well, like I said, we're not going to leave here. If you do not feel safe, you're not going to leave here. We do not feel safe. And then we're like, and then it's so I'm in Philadelphia. <laughs> well, she's in Philadelphia because she's going to be a funeral. Right. Is that what you're talking like days and weeks? No, I'm, I'm talking right here, right now. Right. Yeah. So let me do my notification. Let me go do this paperwork that I'm talking about because we can go back and forth about what it's like all day long. I know, so I promise we're not going to leave here for you to, and you not go safe. Right. Okay. Please. I don't even know what to tell you. It's okay. Just take a seat, have some water, give us a few minutes, let us do our thing, and we'll be back to talk to you, I promise, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Any cross examination? No, sir. Can this witness be released? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, sir. You're released, not subject to recall. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> State, you may call your next witness. State, we call Melissa Ruffgarden. Good afternoon. Can you state and spell your name for the record for us? Uh, Melissa Ruffgarden, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-R-O-U-G-H-G-A-R-D-E-N. Thank you. Counselor, you may inquire. Ma'am, who do you work for? I'm employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. So what is your position with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Currently, I am a forensic biologist with the forensics unit. Prior to this, I was a crime scene investigator for five years. And uh, how long in total have you been with the Orange County Sheriff's Office? About six and a half years. And tell us all the positions you've held during that time. Those two, a crime scene investigator um, and a forensic biologist. Let's turn to your work as a crime scene investigator. Uh, what does a crime scene investigator do? We respond to crime scenes, we photograph and document those crime scenes through photographs, notes, and um, sometimes sketches. We collect evidence, we process the scene, and then we do further processing to the evidence back at our forensics lab. When you say process the, uh, evidence or process the scene, uh, can you tell us what that entails? Yes, it, it depends on the scene and the evidence, but it includes the photographs. We also take swabs for potential DNA. We can also do testing for um, possible blood and things like that. We also process for latent fingerprints, among other things. What type of training did you need in order to become a uh, crime scene uh, investigator? 
Upon being hired with the Sheriff's Office um, as a CSI, I completed a 16-week training program, um, which includes uh, in-house processing as well as going out to crime scenes with uh, trained crime scene investigators to observe and then assist, as well as taking on calls um, with the, uh, crime, the trained crime scene investigator. Approximately how many crime scenes have you processed in the course of your in your course of your time as a CSI? It it would be hundreds. I don't I don't know the exact amount. Were you working in this capacity as a CSI on February twenty fourth, twenty twenty? Yes, I was. And tell us where did you respond out to on that day? I responded to 4748 Franz Court, apartment three. And is that in Orange County, Florida? Yes, it is. And when you responded to that scene, whom did you make contact with? I made contact with the homicide detective, Chelsea Kepsel. Um, did you receive information uh, from the detective? Yes, that it was a death investigation. Did you walk the scene with the detective? Yes. And tell us, what does it mean to, to walk the scene uh, with the detective in a homicide? We go into the scene and uh, just observe. We don't interact with anything and discuss what we see. When you walked this scene, did you see George Torres? Yes, I did. And where was he located? He was located on the floor in the living room of the apartment. Did you, uh, with the detective, identify potential items of evidence to be collected? Yes. You had mentioned previously about documenting scenes with photographs. Was that done in this case? Yes, it was. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been marked for identification as States M and been shown to defense? You may. Ma'am, I'm showing you who has been marked for identification as States M. Can you take a look at the contents of State M to yourself and tell me if you recognize the, uh, the items contained within States M? Yes. Do you recognize the contents of State's M? 
Yes, I do. Tell us, what is the contents of State M? They are photographs I took on the crime scene. Do they fairly and accurately represent how that crime scene appeared on February 24th, 2020? Yes, they do. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification the State's M into evidence. How many photographs are there? Do you have a total? 11. No objection. All right. What was pre-marked as states M will be received into evidence without objection as states 8. Code number 4. Tell us, what is this? This is the front door to the residence. This is also the front door of the residence, just a closer image to the door. When you enter the residence, what is the first area um, just off to the right of the front door? That would be the kitchen. Showing you it's been more of the state's 11. Yes, so this, this is just inside the door. Uh, to the right, there is the, the kitchen area. So this is the uh, counter with the sink in the kitchen, and there's also the open area just above where you can see into the living room. Showing you uh, from State's Composite, photo 19. Oh, yes. What is this? This is a hutch inside the kitchen. You can see in the background that is where um, that first photo of the kitchen was taken. So that's the entryway. And then this is the hutch, and there is a cell phone um, on the hutch in the kitchen. This is the trash can in the kitchen. You can also see the hutch we were just looking at there on the side. States 23. This is the contents of the trash can. You can see two wine bottles on the top of the trash. Did you also find receipts in that trash can as well? Yes. These are those same wine bottles and three uh, Publix receipts that were removed from the trash can. Did you take these items and collect them into evidence in this case? Yes, I did. Yes, this is just in further into that entryway. Um, you can see the living room.
photo 35 from the composite. This is another photo of the living room. You can see the victim located on the floor and a suitcase in the bottom corner of the photograph. Photo 36. This is another photograph in the living room. This is that wall we saw in the kitchen there with the opening. Um, you can also see a wooden baseball bat leaning against the wall. Was that baseball bat collected into evidence in this case? Yes, it was. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is also a photograph of the living room, um, just the other, other side of the room. photograph was taken in the living room. You can see the stairs leading to the second floor. This is a photograph of the living room just from the other side of the room. You can see the front door in the middle back of the photo. This is a more close-up photograph of the suitcase. Photo 50. This is a photograph of one of the uh, zippers on the suitcase. Photograph 51. This is a close-up uh, picture of that same zipper. There is no uh, zipper pull on it. It appeared to be a small wire of some sort, the pink wrapped around the zipper. This is the zipper on the other side of the suitcase. The close-up image of that same zipper. There is also no zipper pull on that one. Photo 54 from the composite. This is the contents of the suitcase after just lifting the lid. close-up image of the items. Um, there were miscellaneous papers and paperwork, some clothing items, and um, apparent blood inside the suitcase. What items, uh, what apparent blood was inside the suitcase? Um, 
You could, it was observed on the white cap and a necktie, and there was also visible blood just um, on the interior of the suitcase. Photo 57 from the composite. Um, the contents of the suitcase, but you can see the white cap, white cap more clearly and the uh, blood observed on it. You can see the necktie with blood. It, it, it appeared to be silver multicolored. And then there's also a uh, diazepam syringe in the plastic uh, casing there. It was prescribed to the victim. That is the miscellaneous papers and paperwork that was removed from the suitcase. Photo 62 from the composite. That's the suitcase after all of the items were removed. That is um, what appeared to be some like small pieces of paper um, that appeared to be soaked with blood. Is this inside of the suitcase? Yes. Photo 65 from the composite. That is the baseball bat that was leaning against the wall in the living room. This is back to the stairs to the second floor in the living room. Mm -hmm. Photo 69 from the composites. This is moving closer to the stairs to the second floor. Photographing um, more of the staircase. These are the steps leading to the second floor before I proceed up to the second floor. The upper portion of the stairs leading to the second floor. How many bedrooms were on the second floor of the unit? There were two bedrooms. Photo 75 from the composite. What is this? This is the hallway. You can see a closet in the hallway and then the door to one of the bedrooms. Did this appear to be a child's room? Yes, it did. Photo 79 from the composite. This is a photograph within the child's bedroom.
photo 86 from the composite. This is the door leading to the other bedroom upstairs. Did this other bedroom also <clears throat> contain a bathroom? Yes, it did. Photo 90 from the composite. This is the bed within that bedroom. Photo 97 from the composite. This is the uh, bathroom. In that master bedroom upstairs? Yes. Did you also have an occasion to photograph the defendant? Yes, I did. You see the defendant here in court today? Yes, I do. Could you please point to them and identify our article of clothing they're wearing? She is right there with a black blazer and a pink shirt. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witnesses identified the defendant? Record will so reflect. Showing you photo 98 from the composite. This is the photograph I took of the defendant. Why is it that you are photographing the defendant at this point? I collected uh, her buckle swabs, which is a DNA standard from the inside of the mouth, and it is part of our procedure to photograph um, that person for identification purposes. Do you also document the rest of her body as well at that time? Yes, I did. Publishing photograph 101 from State's Composite. This is a photograph of her hands facing upward. Photograph 102. This is her right hand facing upward. Her left hand facing upward. Photograph 104. Both of her hands facing downward, so the tops of her hands. Photograph 105. This is her right hand facing downward. left hand facing downward. <clears throat> Photograph 107. This would be of her right arm. Photograph 108. Her left arm. right arm with it facing upward. Photograph 110. Her left arm with her arm facing upward. During the time you were interacting with the defendant, did she ever indicate to you that she had any injuries? No.
previously testified that you also collected physical items of evidence from the home as well in this case. Yes, I did. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been marked for identification as State C and been shown to defense? You may. Ma'am, I'm assuming you was remarked for identification as State C. Can you take a look at that package for me? Yes. Do you recognize that package? Yes, I do. And tell us, what is that package? These are the two wine bottles that were collected from the trash can. Is your name on that package? Yes, my name is on the Orange County Sheriff's Office evidence label that I filled out, and my initials are on the evidence seal from when I sealed the package. And it also has your agency case number and uh, the location information for this case? Yes, that is correct. Ma'am, could you open the contents of States C and look at it to yourself? Yes. them out to recognize the item they're wrapped in. Sure, just have a view from These are the two wine bottles that I collected from the trash can. Do the, are these wine bottles in the same or substantially the same condition as they were at the time that you packaged them on February 24, 2020? Yes, the same time I collected them that day. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as State C into evidence. Any objections? No objections. What was pre-marked as State C will be received into evidence as States 9 without objection. And Your Honor, request permission to publish. You may do so. <clears throat> you can unwrap it now.
have occasion to collect the baseball bat from the living room? Yes, I did. Your Honor, may I approach the witness who has been previously marked for identification as states B and shown to defense? You may. Ma'am, I'm showing you it's been marked for identification as states B. Can you take a look at this item? Yes. Do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. This is the wooden baseball bat I collected from the living room. Does this item have your name on it? Yes, it has my name on the Orange County Sheriff's Office evidence label that I filled out, as well as my initials on the evidence seal. And it also has uh, your initials and your agency case number as well. Yes, it does. Ma'am, can you open States B and look at the contents of it uh, to yourself without uh, displaying it to the court? Yes. What is contained within stage B? The wooden baseball bat. And is that bat in the same or substantially the same condition as it was at the time that you collected it on February 24, 2020? Yes, it is. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's previously been marked for identification as stage B into evidence. Any objection? No objection. What was pre-marked as B will be received into evidence as states 10 without objection. You may. You also had an occasion to collect a suitcase as well in this case. Yes, I did. Prior to placing the suitcase into evidence, uh, did you process it? I took measurements of the suitcase. What are the measurements of the suitcase? It was 28 inches in length, 20 inches wide, and 8 and 7 eighths inches deep. Your Honor, this time you may the witness step down from the stand and approach the clerk's area. Yes.
Ma'am, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as states A. Tell me, do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. Tell us, what is this item? This is the suitcase I collected from the living room. And how is it that you know that this is a suitcase you collected from the living room? It has the Orange County Sheriff's Office evidence label that I labeled with the item description. It also contains my name and the agent's case number. And my initials are also on the evidence sheet. Ma'am, at this time, could you open States A and look at the contents of it to yourself? What is inside of States A? This is the suitcase I collected from the living room. It does appear to be in the same or substantially the same condition uh, as the time that you collected it and placed it into evidence? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to move what's been marked for identification as States A into evidence. Any objections? No objection. What was pre-marked as A will be received into evidence without objection as States 11. And Your Honor, at this time I ask for permission to publish State's aid to the jury. You may. Can you open the inside of it? How easy is it to operate this, the zipper that closes the suitcase? It was a little difficult. I have no additional questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. referred to as a medical examiner investigator as opposed to just crime scene investigator? No, that is not my title. Do you do reports that the crime or that the medical examiner necessarily relies upon in the process of doing the autopsy and additional um, investigations? You would have to ask them. Who makes the decision at the scene as to what items will be photographed and what items will be taken into custody and what items will necessarily be tested or analyzed. That's a collaborative effort between the crime scene investigator and the lead detective uh, while on scene. That would be yourself and who was the lead detective? The lead detective was Chelsea Kepsel. Okay. Now, you authored a report in this matter, did you not? Yes. And that report uh, was utilized, if you in fact know, 
by the medical examiner in developing her autopsy report, was it not? I do not know. In your report, did you advise the medical or whomever might read your report that in fact the body had been removed from the suitcase by first offenders or first responders? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. And we know that you have capacity to do DNA analysis, correct? Um, no, we process DNA and or collect swaps for DNA, and then that's submitted to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for conventional DNA analysis. You did that with uh, a sample from the inside of Sarah Boone's mouth. Her buckle swabs were submitted to the FDLE. And who made that decision? Uh, the detective and I. Who made the decision not to bother to do a DNA analysis on the blood uh, from the items within the suitcase or the suitcase itself? That was a discussion between the detective and I. And you chose not to do that? No, we did not. You assumed the blood inside the suitcase belonged to George Torres, correct? There was blood observed in the suitcase. But you don't know who that belonged to because you didn't bother to analyze it or have it analyzed, correct? The blood was not tested. Now, uh, State's Exhibit B, the bat, uh, you took that into evidence. Was that, again, a collaborative uh, decision by yourself and the lead detective? Yes. And what efforts did you make to have the bat analyzed, uh, given the fact that it was apparently evidence? It was just collected as evidence from the scene. Did you advise either the lead detective uh, or anybody else involved with this investigation that there may be matters that could be analyzed when analyzing the bat that would help or assist in the investigation of this matter? Um, it's my job to do the documentation and the collection of evidence. Well, you said it was a collaborative effort between yourself and the lead detective, so did you participate in that decision? We chose to collect the bat and put it into evidence. And so there was a fiber analysis done on the bat to determine whether or not it was used to strike George Torres when he was in the suitcase, was there not? Uh, pardon? In fact, there was not, was it? There was no effort to analyze the bat. Jack, I don't believe the witness uh, had an opportunity to answer the question. Sustain. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please. Can you repeat the question? Um, if I can remember it, I will. Do you know that there was any effort made in this particular investigation, the investigation of Sarah Boone, to analyze the bat for fibers? No, there was not. And why was that not done? It, it, it was not done. You indicated that you had some interaction with Ms. Boone, is that correct? I collected her buckle swabs. Did you speak with her? Uh, in collecting her buckle swabs, yes. Did you speak to any other witnesses? No. Did you make any determination of other matters that might be uh, of import or evidentiary, evidentiary value when you were going through the house and taking photographs and documenting the interior of the townhouse? You'll have to be more specific. Well, how many pictures of the child's bedroom did we see? Here today? Yes, ma'am. We saw the entrance to the bedroom as well as a photograph of the interior of the bedroom. What was the evidentiary value of that? It's my job to photograph and document while on scene. So the rooms in the upstairs were photographed and documented. Did you photograph? holes in the wall, possibly made by the victim. I don't recall photographing holes in the wall now. Did you take photographs of items within the house or throughout the house that may have depicted incidents of prior violence? I'm, you'll have to be more specific. How about bloody pillowcases? Did you make any effort to collect and analyze pillowcases of the rooms that you were photographing? No. Who made this? You have significant experience with zippers? I use zippers regularly, yes. Enough to have an, an opinion as to whether or not a zipper is stuck or not. Is what? Sorry? 
You just made, you testified on direct that the zipper was a little tight. Just that it was difficult without the zipper pulls to use the zipper. And that was your opinion? Uh, yes, from opening the suitcase here today. Today? You only tested it today? Pardon? You only today have for the first time tested the ability to pull open the zipper on the suitcase? No, I'm saying it was difficult today. A redirect examination. Yes, Your Honor. In this case, um, you documented uh, the, the entirety of the house as you saw it. Yes. So every room in the house? They were all um, taken overall photographs. Walls in the house? In, in the overall photographs, yes. They weren't all individually photographed, no. And you did not document or note any type of holes in the wall or any type of damage to the walls, anything like that? Not the walls, no. Is that something that would have been documented both photographically and also within your report? Yes. You also, as we've previously seen in the composite, saw the victim where he was laying in this case, correct? Yes. Was the victim, did he have blood on his mouth and on his face? Yes, he did. Did he have open wounds on his body? There was blood coming from his nose and his mouth. There was also some other uh, areas of like defects noted on his body. You also made contact with the defendant too as well. Yes. Did you know any other wounds or cuts or anything else that was not documented that you haven't testified to? No. So no wounds, nothing on her? Uh, not that I recall, no. No further questions. Thank you. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. can this witness be released? Judge, we'd like her to be on call. Subject to recall, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Can the parties approach? To the jury, thank you so much for your attention in this matter. It is 4.52. At this time, we're going to go ahead and take our recess for the evening. Um, Madam Clerk has letters that I have signed regarding your jury service for you to provide to your employer. Court deputy will provide them to you in the deliberation room before you are released for the day. I have a similar instruction to read to you that I gave you before the lunch hour. Jurors, you must not conduct any investigation on your own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors do not watch local news or read local newspapers. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends, family members, or even your fellow jurors about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let anyone make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. With that, members of the jury, I'm going to release you back to the deliberation room for you to receive the paperwork for your employer, and we will see you at 9 a.m. this coming Monday, October 21st, and I thank you for your sacrifice and your service.
You all may be seated. Thank you. State, anything else we need to discuss? Not from state. Defense. All right. Thank you all very much. We will see you at 9 a.m. Monday, October 21. We're off the record.